and no idea how many will, will join from China, but I know that there's huge interest in, in uh, AI in China. And uh, we are on YouTube, so you can start. Okay. All right, so could just remind you to keep your uh, microphones muted? Um, uh, and maybe, um, Theodore, if you could just try and check that and, and mute people as a co-host, if they have to. Um. Sure, yeah. Uh, Jörg is here also now. Oh, His oh. Turn. Okay, let's get going. Then. Yeah, I know. Are we ready? Yes. Go ahead. Hello. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the first of a series of uh, sessions um, on theories of the digital. Um, this is uh, part of um, a very new program, um, doctoral design program at Florida International University, FIU, um, that was launched this week. Um, it's a two-year non-residential program. And for this first semester, we will be actually completely all online. Um, and all of the lectures for this particular series and also the lectures for uh, the course that we run called um, Miami Urban Studies, uh, Miami Do You Love Me, will be uh, live streamed. Um, what I want to do today is to um, set out, to begin with, the whole kind of logic behind the course itself. Um, and then I'll be talking about uh, what is AI, just in general terms. Um, I'm delighted to be joined here by not just uh, a group of highly talented DDES students, but also some very significant uh, thinkers in the field. Um, I just want to single out a few and uh, excuse me for overlooking others. Um, but uh, I'm delighted, uh, first of all, that uh, Daniel Bolojan is here. We had a wonderful session. We had a wonderful session with Daniel yesterday, um, and I'm delighted that he's going to be part of the discussion. I'm also delighted that Costas Tazita is one of the kind of the, I would say, godfathers of this field, is joining us from, from Shanghai. Um, uh, Costas is someone whom I, I admire enormously um, and who's been a huge pioneer. Uh, we also other, have under other individuals. Um, the Greek Mafia is here. We have Manos Vermisso from FAU. Uh, we have Nicolo Casas here and, and a few others. Um, and what this is basically, the, the, there is a panel um, comprised of the DDES students themselves and a few guests. And the idea of this particular course is it's not a lecture series so much as a kind of panel discussion. And I'll say more about that um, later. So it's been live streamed on YouTube and Billy Billy. Uh, it will be, the recording will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel and it'll be available for everyone. This is available for free. Um, and in many ways, this is part of the whole educational experience that came out of experiment rather that came out of the Digital Futures uh, Initiative. Um, so um, I want to just uh, maybe just to kind of contextualize things. I'm um, showing you here an early version of Deep um, Himmelblad. That's to say that Deep Himmelblad is, is that old. It's, uh, I think, one of the um, extraordinary initiatives that we've, um, we've seen in, uh, in the last few months, really, um, coming out of the use of AI. This is uh, the work of Daniel Bolojan. Um, and uh, yesterday he was uh, he was showing us some more recent work, which we unfortunately not able are not able to uh, release to the general public just yet. But this gives you some kind of clue of the possibilities um, afforded by um, by by AI. So the idea really is that that what I will be doing to begin with is just to kind of map out um, in general terms the framework within which we are operating. That's kind of I kind of impose that top down, but everything else. I really want to be a kind of bottom-up operation and to have um, an emergent discourse between everyone here. Um, we have some remarkable people in both the DDES and also uh, as guests as well, so I'm hoping it'll go in a new um, direction. 
To my mind, I uh, just want to say that this is a, a course that is attempting to theorize AI. Um, as someone who has sometimes struggled to try and develop a theory of the digital, um, I must say that AI has come up, has, has emerged as a really rich and fertile ground for theorizing um, the, the realm of the digital. And that's partly because it, we, we are forced to engage with some philosophical questions such as consciousness when we deal with AI, but it's also because it seems to me increasingly, and this is something that is my particular um, interest, um, that AI offers us a mirror into trying to understand human intelligence, human creativity, and human design. Um, one of the things I've always um, hoped for, and I think it's beginning to emerge, is that we will be able to use this new realm as a way of thinking about our own. Um, the initial example, of course, um, was that of Craig Reynolds, um, who attempted to model the flocking behavior of birds, and using what he called boids. And in order to do this, he had to, in a sense, reverse engineer. He had to um, uh, um, try and understand what the behavior of birds were. And so he was able to draw up a series of um, rules, go in roughly the same direction as the birds around you, at the same speed, and so on and so on, keep a certain distance apart from them, and so on and so on, which then allowed the, the, the ornithologist or bird experts or whatever to understand that flocking behavior. So I'm what my real interest is really is ultimately seeing how AI can be um, a mirror in which we can understand human operations. And of course, AI, as we'll discuss in a moment, is of course loosely braced, based on uh, at least certain neural networks are loosely based on the brain. Um, can they tell us how the brain operates? The brain for many has been really largely a black box. We still don't understand it, but can AI maybe open up some kind of insights into this. Um, so in the background then is this kind of radical experimentation that's going on um, in, uh, in, in the world of architecture, which is fascinating in itself. Um, to my mind though, AI is gonna have a huge impact beyond the experimentation of um, these novel forms. Um, and over the next decade, by the end of the decade, I think we'll find that AI has really become very central to how we operate as architects. So I want to set this in the broader context of um, a term that uh, Philip Yuan and I have um, been um, promoting, uh, that is to say, architectural intelligence. Um, now, there have been a number of, of, uh, of books on architectural intelligence with the title, one that was uh, looking at four particular architects in the past who contributed towards the development of the digital. We're interested in actually in broadening that out to look at a whole range of, um, of, of aspects of intelligence within the realm of architecture. I think the, the word, uh, the term architectural intelligence was actually the first, um, was first coined by Akoto Se Watanabe, um, the uh, Japanese computational architect um, who was exploring how uh, AI could become a form of architectural intelligence. Wan Yu He has also used the term architectural intelligence. Um, again for AI and we're looking at look at AI within the context of architectural intelligence but also within the context of other manifestations shall we say of, of intelligence within architecture that is to say um, swarm intelligence um, uh, material intelligence structural intelligence environmental intelligence and so on um, uh, in fact the theme of um, this year's digital futures conference is going to be material intelligence and that's not necessarily the intelligence of materials themselves, because maybe you could argue that materials, um, they're active, but they may be not intelligent in the sense that we might understand it. Um, but at the same time, I think there's an intelligence way, intelligent way to operate with materials. Um, so this is the kind of broader category that, that uh, um, we promoted in this particular book um, uh, in, the, in the introduction. Um, uh, published by Springer last year, um, it's a very expensive book, I don't expect you to buy it, but I think my point is that the term architecture intelligence is going to be, I think, a hugely important one. In fact, the term intelligence itself, I'm sure, is going to be a kind of radical part of the lexicon in, of architects in the future. Um, some of you might have uh, know, known about the call for papers that uh, uh, 
uh, Tad had last last Friday. I think some of you might have been submitting papers uh, for a special issue with the theme of intelligence. So it's going to be um, uh, AI, I guess, um, but um, in a more expansive notion of what is architectural intelligence. In my view, soon all architecture is going to be intelligent. So what I've done is um, laid out um, a series of, of themes um, that uh, um, kind of guide each particular session. There are 12 sessions. Um, and, and these themes, strangely, they, they, well, they come out of uh, a book that I just completed on AI. And they kind of presented themselves. I hadn't, when I started writing, I didn't think that I would um, be talking about these things, but they emerged as clearly the topics that had to be addressed. Um, so this is loosely structured on some of these um, on, the, on the book, although consciousness is not in the book. But I'm going to start off then with this question about what is AI. Um, and without saying too much about that, I think that one of the crucial things we need to do, at least from my perspective, I found myself that, that uh, I had to start dif making different definitions and distinctions. Um, first of all, and most obviously between AI and human intelligence, but then within the category of AI itself, we use the term, but actually there are many different aspects of it and you can break it down in, in various ways. You can break down the ways in which you can, um, the types of training you get, the um, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, uh, reinforcement learning. You can look at the different kind of camps, um, ways of thinking, um, that uh, um, have been developed to, to look at AI. There are, there are five or so different tribes um, as they've been referred to and so on and so on. So AI is not a um, homogeneous category. Well, it's a term that refers to a lot, but it can be broken down in order to understand it. I think you need to make some definitions. So I will start to make some of those definitions um, today and really more of a way of provoking a discussion. The second um, session is going to be about the question of consciousness. I mean, this, I think, to my mind, is really one of the most fascinating and difficult challenges that um, we face. Um, the difference, just to say the difference between um, AI and human intelligence is, is that AI doesn't have consciousness, at least, at least not just yet. Um, and it forces us to address the question about what is consciousness, um, uh, a deeply complex uh, and problematic question. Then, of course, the question arises whether consciousness is so important in the first place. And that's a different issue, maybe. The history of AI, um, and uh, I think just in order to understand um, AI, you need to know it's something of its history, um, the way it's evolved, the kind of incredible excitement that happened at the beginning, um, and then the kind of the, the what are called AI winters, the moments when um, <clears throat> uh, confidence in AI collapsed and funding collapsed. And then I'll go on to look at three, <coughs> three separate high profile moments that really brought um, AI into consciousness, uh, into people's consciousness, and, and to make people, make people aware of these things. Big events, the, um, the famous uh, you know, chess match, um, uh, Gary Kasparov uh, taking on um, IBM's Deep Blue and in 1997 and famously losing. Um, uh, then the, the case of Jeopardy when IBM again, what IBM was Watson, uh, beat two of the leading human contestants um, in a general knowledge game. And then thirdly, the game of Go, um, AlphaGo um, against Lee Sedol, the Korean grandmaster, um, that really had an astonishing impact on the world of AI. Um, it was, as Kai Fu Lee put it, um, the Sputnik moment in China, the moment when they realized that their national, they could be beaten at their national game by, um, by, by, by AI, and of course, also in Korea itself. And, and what I want to then show is in a way that kind of the visibility and invisibility of AI, we, we, we can't see it. Um, uh, so we don't know quite if it's there or not. And it need, we need these high profile moments, which in some senses are slightly cynical as a way to be aware of it. And I think they're, the role of these moments was much to do with um, increasing public um, funding support for what they're doing, private support for what they're doing, as it was for demonstrating what they could do. Um, but there's a dark side to this. In other words, if we don't know if AI is there or not, then there's a risk of people exploiting the term and using it as a marketing tool. Um, Theodorus, uh, who is Galanus, who is here today, has the theory that anyone who has AI in the name of the firm 
probably isn't using AI. Um, and it's a kind of a logic, shall we say, of reverse inverse camouflage. If camouflage is to pretend that something isn't there when it is, then inverse camouflage is to pretend that something's there when it's not. Um, I think we have to be very suspicious of the AI of marketing. Beware the AI of marketing. Um, the next question, the number one is number four, is uh, the fourth session is going to be on AI and creativity. And there's also going to be a session on digital futures on AI and creativity around the same time. And this, I think, is one of the most fascinating um, aspects of what we're going to deal with. Um, the received view has been that uh, computers cannot initiate anything. They can't create anything, can't generate anything. Um, and that's been disproved. Uh, they're certainly good at generating things. Whether they're aware of what they're generating is another question. And whether we can call that creativity is another, another issue. But nonetheless, creativity uh, is one of the kind of cre the key questions. And what there I'll be kind of going through some of the things from a slightly different perspective um, that Daniel mentioned um, uh, yesterday in dealing with style GANs and other forms of, of um, let's call them uh, hallucination. Um, and I certainly, I think that, that, that we can generate novel outcomes, should we say at least. Um, the question of hallucination feeds into the fifth session where I'm gonna try and pick up on some of the debates that were going on over the summer when we invited Refik Anadol one of the leading media artists, the most inspirational media artists around, um, and Anil Seth, who is one of the most interesting neuroscientists to discuss the link between them. And I think what is so interesting to my mind is that uh, the term hallucination has been used both by Refik Anadol to refer to his machine hallucinations, and it's also been used by Anil Seth, um, who is himself a, someone who knows a lot about AI because he did his PhD in AI, even though he's one of the leading Neuroscientist and Anil Seth's uh, um, dominant uh, kind of uh, well, is, is the, the area where he's working right now is the is the the question of uh, of, of um, predictive perception, where he argues that all forms of perception are a form of controlled hallucination. So the term hallucination is there, and um, so the issue then becomes how do we maybe use some of the terms, some of the thinking about AI to understand how the human mind works? And I want to go in that session to try and think how how architects work, how they think. Um, which brings us to the next session, <clears throat> which is say AI and architectural design, where there's been some radical experimentation going on in this field. Um, one thing I will say is that uh, two years ago, Matthias and, Matthias and I um, uh, put in a, a bid, in fact, two years ago, Matthias on his own put in a bid to do an AD on AI and architecture, and Neil Spiller turned it down because it didn't seem relevant enough. Eventually, we joined forces, and both Matthias and I will be um, editing an, an issue of AD that will come out next year. And um, all of a sudden, since that time when Neil Spiller was kind of telling us initially, or telling Matthias initially that it wasn't important, suddenly we have this explosion. AI is kind of everywhere in terms of schools of architecture and also in certain leading practices, especially Corp Himmelblau, um, Zahadid Architects and so on. And so that session will be looking at kind of experimental design, largely based on the use of GANs, but not, not totally. Um, that is to say, using representational techniques. But I think that the radical issue is not this form of formal exploration, which is, I think, incredibly inventive. And I think some of the work coming out is truly astonishing. Um, Matthias makes the comment, this is the, the first genuinely 21st century novel approach towards design, and I completely agree. Um, but I still think that actually the real, the real um, game changer is not going to be these funky forms, it's going to be ways of operating. And I want to draw upon here a discussion that we had over the summer with Wen Yu He, who is um, with us today, and Hovard Hochlet. Wen Yu He is the CEO of X Cool, um, uh, uh, named after Rem Kohlhaas, OMA, where she used to work. And X Cool is, is one, of the, one of the two leading um, uh, startups looking at AI for architecture, and uh, the other one being Space Maker AI that has recently been bought up by uh, Autodesk. Um, and I think this is what came out of that discussion in the summer was really, in many ways, the most radical. Um, one of the comments that was made was that uh, Harvard, Hook, Harvard Hookland said that uh, clients are now insisting that AI, that their architects use AI. Um, there are not many platforms available at the moment, but that's interesting. And of course, they were doing that because um, AI allows you to optimize the outcome. It gives you a range of different options um, and so on and so on and so on. And clients are asking for that now. And that, to my mind, is going to be the game changer. Absolutely the game changer. Never mind all the incredible 
experimental um, forms that are going to come out. I think that will be the game changer. I'm absolutely convinced that in 10 years' time, every single office um, will be using AI. And the comment that, uh, again, they make in Spacemaker AI is that those who use AI will replace those who don't use AI. So to my mind, this is almost the most crucial session, even though the forms don't look as sexy as the previous one we'll be looking at. Um, then we're going to move on to look at performative design, performance-driven design. I think there's a, there's a risk that uh, we get caught up in the kind of two-dimensional representational logic um, of GANs. That's not to say that GANs isn't a process. It is a process, but there's a risk that we get caught up in the world of representation. And I've always been interested in the question about performance, um, structural performance especially. So I'm going to invite some of our some of our team to maybe reflect on that. I don't, I, I'll hope that the Theodorus Galanos can maybe help us with, with some of that. Theodorus has been writing some of the, um, the software, um, infrared and so on, um, which is really changing the nature of how we, how we design in terms of performance. And to my mind, this is also an important issue because of the, the, the kind of the, eth the ethical imperative we have to be more aware of the resources that we're using. Um, the next session is going to be on swarm intelligence. This is, this is an area which has been, I think, um, it first hit the architectural scene around this, the, the millennium. Um, when I was teaching at the AA, everyone was writing about emergence or swarm intelligence. Um, and it became a, an area of um, radical experimentation. Some wonderful work came out, uh, Roland Snooks, Elisa Andrushek, and so on. Um, indeed, Daniel Bologian himself, um, exploring multi-agent systems. Um, uh, I guess the problem in some ways was that it only went so far. The intelligence of a swarm is not necessarily as, as, as advanced as the intelligence of AI itself. But, but this, I think, was, was a radically interesting way of thinking. And to my mind, probably the most relevant part of it is not necessarily, again, the forms that have been produced, but how it explains certain sort of cultural um, uh, behaviors, especially the logic of the marketplace. I think Kevin Kelly's uh, use of, of, of swarm intelligence to explain how the market is out of control, a bottom-up operation, that's hugely insightful. But that, that discussion about swarm intelligence is going to set the scene for what a, a session I call Brain City, which is looking at how AI operates at the level of the city. Um, the question to be posed is, what will the city of the future look like? Will it look like um, something out of the Jetsons with flying cars or something out of, um, indeed, Blade Runner? Or will, it look, will cities look much like they do today, um, but with the buildings retrofitted with um, <clears throat> the latest technology and traffic controlled <clears throat> by AI? So in this session, which is actually the one I take, in this session, I'm going to look at what I call brain city. We, we know from swarm intelligence that we can, we can conceive of the brain of the city as a kind of, um, kind of brain at a low level, maybe. Um, what, I'm, what I want to suggest is the use of, of AI to enhance the operations of the city. I'm thinking here particularly of the uh, uh, Alibaba and the, um, the, 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 the company they've got, which is called um, City Brain, which is used to kind of to control the, um, the traffic in certain cities. To my mind, the city of the future will be completely controlled by AI. Um, then we're going to skip out, as it were, of, of the digital as such and um, uh, look at um, uh, material intelligence, which I think is um, an increasingly important um, issue that we've been dealing with. It is, of course, as I mentioned, the, the theme of um, digital, digital futures, uh, the core that's coming up for this summer. Um, it's certainly something I think that Philip Yuan is extremely interested in, and it embraces some of the discussions that were going on, <clears throat> on um, yesterday on uh, uh, the Shell Structure session on digital futures. Um, where uh, Siegfried, Siegfried uh, Adrianson, um, Chris Williams, um, and Philippe Bloch uh, were talking about how they were using computation to make intelligent structures. So material intelligence really is not necessarily uh, the intelligence of materials, but the intelligent use of materials and how we can use, especially increasingly also, how we can use uh, computation to model that kind of behavior. And finally, um, a session on the the dark side of, of AI. I uh, <clears throat> I'll talk more about this later. But um, initially, when I started working on this, um, I was going to be looking at the impact of AI on the progression of architecture, and um, uh, uh, that was the kind of the starting point. I then started thinking, well, we need to talk about what is AI in the first place, and no one had really written about that in architecture. But that still remains my concern. Um, uh, 
what will let this lead to. Um, <clears throat> so something about the swarm. Um, the sw swarm is somehow a kind of emblem, as, as I see it anyway, of that really um, can help inform a lot of things we're doing um, in this kind of pro in this program. Um, uh, what is interesting about the swarm um, is that it it it's it's greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, we, we'll, I won't go into the whole theory of the swarm. Um, but it basically, it, it leads to an emergent situation um, where th novelty comes out of the interaction between the agents within any system. Now, that's what I'm hoping for here. I'm hoping that um, rather than being a top-down thing, and of course, I'm being very top-down to begin with, just laying out certain constraints and so on, um, rather than being top-down thing, that something in a bottom-up way will emerge um, totally unpredictable. Uh, and I think that creativity itself is a form of, of emergence. Um, um, so, so it's, the idea in some ways is that we can learn this together, like in a, a flock of birds, that by following and being aware of each other, um, uh, we uh, uh, can learn. It could be a collective learning experience. And I'm quite convinced that I will learn as much from you, and more than from you, as, uh, than, I, than I will, will be able to, what you will learn from me. Um, part of the kind of the issue here is the fact that on this DDES, we have some exceptionally uh, exceptional individuals, some of them world leaders in the world of AI, AR, and 3D printing. Uh, there's pointless me trying to teach world leaders that, but I think collectively we could learn together. And that is that is the that is the aim behind this, the, the kind of the, the logic of the swarm in terms of the educational model. And finally, I would say that, you know, one thing I want to um, wouldn't say apologize for is to say, but I'm, I'm approaching this as a theorist. In other words, I'm, although I'm aware of the operations of AI, and I've been playing around with it, shall we say, I am no technical expert in this area. Um, Daniel Bolajan is and gave us a, a, a wonderful display yesterday of his insights into the actual operations of AI. Um, I'm going to act as a kind of like a theorist against that foil and offer some kind of reflection on AI itself. And in some ways, the reason for that is, and maybe the justification of being a theorist in the first place, um, I mean, some people will be skeptical of theorists. Um, my colleague, uh, uh, Thomas Spiegelhalter, is always criticizing me because I'm not designing buildings and doing these things. But nonetheless, I think there's a role for a theorist, and that is to say, to get an external pers perspective on things. When you're in a flock, um, a flock of birds, you don't know what the overall flock of birds looks like. You, all you're doing is you're aware of the birds around you, and you need to step back to, um, to see the behavior, the overall behavior of that flock of birds. And that's how I see theory, having enough of an understanding of what the flock is, but at the same time stepping back and seeing it from a, from a, a certain perspective. And maybe there's an advantage to be outside of the system in some ways. My experience has been that, for example, when I'd finished in my early on in my career, my first book I published was a translation of, of Alberti, um, his book De Re Identificatoria, the, um, his treatise on architecture. And I recall right afterwards, I was asked by um, Gordana Corolia to give a lecture at the AA about a Alberti. And I said, I can't do that. I can't do that. I mean, and actually, I couldn't. I was so locked in. I knew that every single word in Alberti at that time. I've lost the memory now, but at that time, I knew every single word in Alberti. And I could tell you about that. But I couldn't talk about Alberti. It's a bit like, let's say, a mechanic um, operating on Michael Schumacher's uh, engine or, or Hamilton's engine, a uh, 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 Grand Prix uh, uh, car. The mechanic knows the mechanics of the thing, but the driver knows how to control the thing. So at some level, I think this is the role of theory to not be too close, but to be cl sufficiently close, but also sufficiently distant to order to make that happen. So the swarm is in many ways emblematic of all these things. And then just, uh, there was a whole trajectory we had where we we're looking at a range of different things in digital futures world. Digital futures world was itself an experiment, um, an education experiment. We it started off when we realized that you could use this global platform to reach out and um, to reach parts of the world otherwise you would never have reached. I had a review of my for my students at FIU and I brought on board Gilles Retzin in London and uh, um, Wan Yuhe in China and also Philip Yuan in China. And all of a sudden we had a review that we, uh, uh, as like a dream team of reviewers we could never have done before. And the other second thing issue was that we, discovered that the, the following week, actually, Matthias Delcampo was streaming his review from the University of Michigan, and he had some like a thousand or so followers. And we realized that you could also reach a huge audience. So Digital Futures World was an experiment in that where we actually had 
12,000 applications for uh, 80 workshops and 50 discussions. So we actually were able to reach out um, to, to people we otherwise would not have, have met. We were able to make discussions between um, individuals who otherwise would not have met. I remain, recall distinctly uh, when you heard and, uh, Howard Hoekland in the session on the AI in the future of the office, we brought two individuals together who'd never met before. And actually I was scared they were gonna fight, but they got on very well and they were talking about collaboration. Um, so that, and we also realized that actually you can, you can break through the walls of the classroom. You can break through, break through the walls of the classroom and do something very special and include those disadvantaged uh, individuals who otherwise wouldn't have access to these ideas. And that became a kind of, for us, a really important part of our mission um, to be inclusive, to reach out to the rest of the world. In fact, also to use the, the, the platform to break down the notion of the center and the periphery. So it became a kind of more kind of global network. And one of the things I would say, I've mentioned this several times, but I'll repeat this here, and that to say that uh, when I was teaching in Dessau, where there are almost no fees, it's almost completely free, I began to realize that you get talent everywhere in the world. Um, uh, the top 2%. Roughly, I don't know. Um, of every country is talented. It's just that students in some countries are not able to access privileged education. They simply can't afford the fees. And I had some wonderful students from Bangladesh who had all been offered places the AID, AID, the AADRL, but weren't able to go there. Um, so this is really. There's also something here about trying to make education free. Um, so digital futures has been about that, and it's been trying to kind of radically. Um, overhaul in some way architectural education. Um, uh, uh, Philippe Morel made a fantastic point that really the role of digital futures is akin to the role of, 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 of um, Uber um, in, in terms of the, the taxi industry. The taxi industry that I think was very slack, that really wasn't um, operating very well, Uber came along and forced it to upgrade its, its particular um, it's particular to the way of operating. And that's what we're hoping to do in terms of education. But this, this particular course is a step further in that direction. And in fact, Philip, Yuan and I are talking about the possibility of setting up a digital consortium whereby students from all over the world can tap into the same kind of debates. Um, up until now, we've had individual professors and individual um, schools of architecture talking about things. But what happens if we, if we were to operate collectively? What happens if we had the leading expert in AI, in AR and robotic fabrication, and so on and so on, contributing to that sort of debate? Um, uh, and, and that's something that I think we, we're going to be pushing ahead with. Um, and I'm really interested in, in how we can do that. But this is almost like a, this particular kind of course is a, an experiment within that kind of, um, in that direction. Um, in, in an unofficial way, we're trying to see what happens when you have a kind of collective form of education. And some of the debates we had during the summer, and I've just put the links on here to those, those, um, um, those, those debates, they're all, all uploaded onto the Digital Futures YouTube channel, which is different from the one that this is gonna be uploaded on, which is gonna be the FIU channel. But out of that became something emerged in terms of a kind of a, a, kind of a critique of, of mainstream education. Um, one of the things that uh, Areti Mokopolu of IAC, um, of IAC, who mentioned was that uh, really we need to rethink what it is to be an educator these days. The idea of a professor as the kind of fount of all knowledge is already obsolete. Um, uh, um, and we need to kind of move forward to a position where um, uh, we operate more as a kind of catalyst of change. Um, as a, a, or a stimulator of conversations, which is precisely what I'm hoping to do in this particular kind of session once I finish this particular top-down description in some ways. Um, we need to radically overhaul education. Um, there's no point tinkering. Again, Philippe has made some comments about this. You know, we, up until now, people have made little changes here and there. We need to radically rethink this and think about how we can really get over this elitist perception of education that it's only available for those who can pay for that, for the resources and to spread it elsewhere. So anyway, I'm just putting down there a series of, of, of the, the links which where we debated education. Um, and another thing that I think came out of this was a wonderful session with Sanjay Sama in the second one, The Future of Education. Sanjay Sama is open, head of open learning at MIT. And he was talking about how actually when, you, when you're giving a lecture, there's only a short attention span. So I'm not going to give long lectures. They're not going to give monologues. Um, I'm going to try and find out ways how we can learn learn together. Um, 
and, and it's always always struck me that that the as an educator, you find yourself paraphrasing what other people are saying. I then thought, well, okay, if I'm going to sort of a paraphrasing a TED talk, I'm going to give, I'm going to show this TED talk. My students complained and said, well, why am I paying for this when I'm, you're just giving me a TED talk I could watch any other time. But that's not really the point. The idea is really is to try and how we can democratize things and open things up. Um, and how can we um, see ourselves not as the purveyors of knowledge, not as the people, but as somehow as a kind of catalyst for inquiry. So anyway, this is part of the experiment to, uh, 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 towards that. Um, I believe in experimentation. I believe in mutation and changing and adapting to a new world. And one thing that digital futures gave us is to pointed out that the digital future is already here and we're making use of this platform um, precisely to kind of make that happen. So, um, and then just to say, I'm not, um, I mentioned before, I'm not gonna teach you about, I don't know enough actually, frankly, about um, how you teach the mechanics of, 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 um, of AI. On the right-hand side, I would say possibly the best um, book around at the moment if you want to uh, find out how to use GANs, generative adversarial networks, in order to um, hallucinate forms. Um, and we'll be talking more about that. And on the left-hand side, this is the book that I think is the best overall view of AI in general um, by Melanie Mitchell, who has a PhD in the field. And this is a wonderfully lucid um, book and really gives you some general, um, a general understanding in, in lay person's terms. You know, it's not, it's, it's, it's a guide for thinking humans, not for AI experts. And I would really recommend that. What this misses out on is, the, you know, is basically the, the generative uh, GANs themselves. But nonetheless, I think there's a really useful background. So um, today, then I'm going to focus more on particularly on AI rather than architectural intelligence as, as a whole. Um, and I want to just kind of maybe uh, give you my offer some personal experiences of why I, um, well, how I view um, AI. And this was a, a kind of, at one level, a completely insignificant moment, um, boarding a plane to Shanghai. At the same time, it was really a moment that changed my worldview. I mean, it was just in those few seconds, I was absolutely shocked by the potential of AI. And what I'm doing, basically, I'm walking up, I don't know why I'm taking a photograph, but I'm walking up to, um, I'm glad I did. I'm walking up to go and board a plane. I had my boarding pass. And the flight attendant said, no, I don't need your boarding pass. Just look at that screen, uh, which I did. And all of a sudden, the second image there, it recognizes me. And then it tells me on the third side of my seat. Um, I was, I was, I'd been, I was, I fly in business class. I'd been to the business land. I had a couple of drinks and I was, I was a bit spaced. And I thought, holy shit, how did it recognize me from all the people in the world, because that's precisely what it does. It recognizes you from all the people in the world. And that was the point where I realized how good AI was and also how terrifyingly good uh, or terrifying is and I, it, it, AI. So I, I have this view that basically AI is terrifyingly good. Um, I don't think personally that AI is evil in and of itself, I, um, no more than a kitchen knife. I mean, you could use a kitchen knife to cut your vegetables, you can also use it as a, as a murder weapon. I don't think AI is, uh, in itself is um, uh, is dangerous. It's really a question of the affordances that you put to AI, how you use it, and it's based on that. You know, it is an ethics behind how you should use AI and so on and so on and so on. I don't think it's evil in and of itself, but it has this terrifying capacity, um, which is why in some ways uh, Elon Musk, um, who is, I think his position sums this up very clearly, whereby he he obviously works with AI. In the Tesla cars are, um, are, are use AI extensively, as does SpaceX and so on. Um, <clears throat> but he's also skeptical about, about AI, warning us that it could lead to um, the end of humanity. And I think that one of the things he was part of, he withdrew his funding from, was the Open AI. And this is the platform where they're exploring natural language processing. Um, and recently, um, GPT-3 um, was released and has astonished individuals. Um, uh, David Chalmers in particular um, has, uh, ex uh, has been commenting on this and, and sees this as a, a step towards the point where AI gains consciousness. I'm not sure that's quite the case myself. Nonetheless, it's raised a lot of philosophical, philosophical issues. So um, there is a good side and there is a bad side to AI is what I'd say. On the one hand, you have Alan Turing where he's talking here um, not about uh, 
um, AI as such. In fact, it, it, at the time he says it, it wasn't even coined the term, um, but more about the potential of, of, of computation. And, and this kind of optimism that expresses um, is something that I share in some ways. Um, um, Alan Turing was forms is, is an integral part of the whole history of AI. Um, and as with the logic of visibility and invisibility, he was completely invisible. He was working on secret, um, break, working on code breaking for during the Second World War, all of which was contained under covered under the Official Secrets Act. And it, the information about what he'd done was not even released until after his death. So nobody knew um, who he was. And he was, you know, but all of a sudden, we, he's now become a kind of poster boy for the gay world. He's become, uh, it, people recognize his contribution. He's appeared on movies, The Imitation Game, and he's appearing here on the 50 pound note in the UK. So on the one hand, it has that capacity to really um, be amazing. And it also has the capacity to um, frankly make us redundant. Um, I'm struck by this comment by Gary Kasparov. Um, this is, I think the fourth game of his match against um, Deep Blue in 1997. And he's, it's, he's putting his head in his hands. This game was finished within 19 minutes and he was beaten. Um, and at one point, one way you can see this as being a, a kind of triumph for AI over human beings. At the same time, Gary Kasparov sees it as being a triumph for human ingenuity because we're the ones who created AI. And of course, we have to see this in the context of um, either Moore's law, the law of accelerating returns as Ray Kurzweil has now, is now looking at it. Um, in terms of exponential change. Um, things are changing really radically in this field. Um, in the course of this last semester, when I was giving a, a series of lectures um, to my students in advanced theory in, at FIU, in the course of that series, in the course of the course itself, huge changes have happened. One of my students, um, Darren Ockhart, is a, has a Tesla. And he told me one week, uh, that Tesla, they, they, you, it's just been upgraded and now it was completely, it, could, it was self-driving. Um, and uh, that I find astonishing. The speed of change is, is, is accelerating. Um, and, and likewise, GPT-3 GPT uh, was released uh, uh, um, during, recently and that has changed things. So I, you know, things are changing radically. So I ended up in a situation whereby um, I had started writing a book um, about AI. I was initially, approached by Helen Castle of RIB Pub Publishing, and she wanted me to write a book about the impact of AI and architecture. And uh, my conclusion was that um, it was going to actually destroy the profession. I, I, I said, I, I, yes, I, 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 here's my title, The Death of the Architect. And uh, Helen said, well, it's not very good for our, our members. Um, could we have a death of the architect uh, question mark? And I said, no, I think it should be the death of the architect exclamation mark. Um, anyway, it seemed to me that, that it was going to be difficult to publish with them, so I moved to Bloomsbury, and I went in, and I started working on this topic with Bloomsbury, and then I said, well, you know, this, we should really be aware of both the, the, the positive side and the dark side of AI, and I, um, so now there are two books. This is the first one, which I've just completed the manuscript for. It's about to come out in, um, I think, in, will be coming in October, um, about how AI can be, um, um, what, how we can use it, and on the front cover is a um, an image um, generated, hallucinated, shall we say, by Refik Anadol, based on a data set of images by Zahadid architects. And um, of course, one has to be selected in what has been generated in this case by a kind of form of style GANs. But nonetheless, it looks very similar to a Zaha design, <clears throat> but it's not a Zaha design. It is coming out of the computer. I am astonished by what it can do. My prediction is that by the end of the decade, it will be able to design a building for us completely autonomously according to what we are aesthetic preferences. Um, the next book is going to be about the dark side of it in a profession that is already struggling, I think will really um, be in, in, a, in, a, in a difficult state as a result of this. And my point is that this is the, the black one, the white one is the kind of the angelic one, the black cover is the dark one, the dark side of things. But in many ways, they're two sides of the same coin. Because as soon as AI designs your building, <clears throat> um, that is the moment when there's the death of the architect. As soon as uh, a self-driving car can drive for you, that's the point where we will begin to lose our driving skills and driving, human driving will fade out. <clears throat> so I want to um, open up with a general question today about what is generally, what is AI, artificial intelligence. Um, and as I say, I want to basically try and open up and look at uh, um, the distinctions to be made. Uh, 
And the first thing I want to say is, if you're thinking about AI, don't think about this. It's not about being surrounded by humanoid robots or indeed any form of, ro well, I guess robots are, are, will always be surrounded by robots. The point about AI, it's basically, if you want to think about AI, think algorithms and think, we don't see it. We can't see algorithms, but at the same time, we are absolutely saturated. We are immersed in a culture of AI, whether we know it or not. Um, in other words, our spam on our email accounts is filtered by AI. Um, we're uh, all our, our kind of online social media things are being controlled by AI. AI. Um, I use WeChat a lot. WeChat has a fantastic, increasingly good uh, translation service um, that is improving, and that's part of the logic of AI, it's AI itself. Um, deep learning, it's improving by, by every day. Everywhere is kind of being controlled by AI. When you use Gmail and it starts suggesting the end of your sentence, it knows what you normally say, and it's suggesting something based on that. Um, so we are absolutely Im immersed by AI. It's controlling us when we, uh, it's showing us the way to when we, when we should go um, when, we, when we drive our cars through ways and so on. It's telling us when we're straying out of line, um, when we're with a kind of bleeping sound, when we're driving uh, new cars and so on and so on and so on, everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Um, but we're not aware of it. Um, so it's as though to my mind, uh, the earth has been invaded by a completely uh, invisible new force. Um, and it's, this is where it is. These cell phones um, are, I mean, the city is full of AI because we said that we wear our, our, our devices as much as we are our clothes and the city itself is already colonized through AI by means of this, but it'll go much further. Um, so I wanted to start, this is, forgive me for that rather long-winded introduction, but I think it was kind of just, I want to just set the frame for what we're going to do and then open up to a kind of bottom operation. But I, I wanted to start really with a question. Um, Costas, uh, a while back, I was, I don't know, but two years ago, um, we had a discussion. Um, in fact, Wan Yu He was also there, also part of it, <clears throat> in Shanghai. And he was giving me a tough time because I, uh, my understanding of AI was that it just sort of simulated um, what, what humans do in some ways. And uh, um, he said, well, that might be the Wikipedia def definition. I don't know if it is the Wikipedia definition, but actually it's a definition of someone like um, Margaret Bowden um, <clears throat> to some extent. Margaret Bowden is, is a, I don't want to be negative about her. She's a wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, she's at the University of Sussex, um, in, just outside Brighton. And she's been a huge pioneer in terms of um, not only talking about AI, but cognitive, cognitive science in general. She set up the world's first cognitive science department there. That is to say, no longer, I mean, I guess back in the 90s, we had a kind of the dominant discourse was, let's say, comparative, comparative literature or, or critical theory. The dominant theoretical discourse was that. And that increasingly has mutated into what is now known as cognitive science, which is to say AI, neuroscience, and some aspects of philosophy. I guess you can call what Andy Clark does, a kind of philosophy. Um, and neuroscience has become increasingly part of that. I myself have attempted to write about psychoanalysis um, and architecture in my book, Camouflage, but now it seems that neuroscience, which is much more rigorous in a way <clears throat> from a scientific perspective, I mean, the psychoanalysis kind of Freud presumes there is an unconscious, but you know doesn't go much further than that. But now we're discovering really how complex things are. Anyway. Margaret Bowden is a wonderful woman, one of the pioneers, and she's also a colleague of Andy Clark and Anil Seth um, at the University of Sussex. But she makes this statement, and I would say this book on, on, on the right here, um, AI's Nature and the Future, is also one of the great books about AI in terms of explaining things in a very uh, accessible way. But she makes this statement, which I kind of used in my book, and then I looked at it and I said, is that true? Is, is, that, is that what AI does? Um, so anyway, I wanted to kind of like start, start with a kind of provocative question just to go and set off the discussion um, by asking, I think some of the people here who are, um, uh, we have a, you know, some, some real experts. Is this, is this what you think AI does? And I don't know whether Theodore or Costas or Daniel or anyone would like to comment on that. Um, uh, maybe Marina, I don't know. Um, 
is this this is like a, a, a kind of yeah a question to try and provoke things is there anything wrong with this statement i guess is what i would say is there anything wrong with this statement um let me invite invite anyone to to chip in and to kind of um comment on that um is this what it does um I mean, let me say that certainly one of the one of the tribes, so we call it within AI, connectionism, is really about trying to model um, AI on the brain. The neural network is loosely modeled on the neurons on the brain, but is this what AI does, um, Costas, um, Daniel? I think maybe maybe I can I ha I can have a small comment on this. I think that uh, currently, at least the the artificial intelligence, let's say the applied methods we see around us, mostly deep learning and RL. I'm not sure it does this. It actually kind of does the opposite. I think most of the deep learning models are doing things, the sort of things that our minds cannot do which is like handle multidimensional information and, and at scales that are incredible, right? And extract and learn through that. Our minds do the opposite. Like I was teaching my daughter earlier how to open and close a box. And I only show her once for a few seconds and I never had to show her again. So, so this kind of uh, human intelligence that say this is what our minds do, I think, uh, at the very basic level. and. AI currently is not that, but it is seeking to to create, let's say, yeah, I guess AGI would be would be seeking to create something that, you know, can make decisions like we do or think like we do. I guess that's that's the the very end goal. But I think currently AI is is mostly doing or is mostly focusing on, you know, I'm not sure if there are low hanging fruits. I think there are extremely difficult tasks that are also difficult for us. And this goes also for design, right? Like when we are thinking about AI and architectural design or engineering design, the first applications I see all around me is usually optimization or like, you know, how can I, can I go through this huge design space and understand, you know, what kind of decisions, you know, what kind of parameters and what works best. And these are exactly things that we really cannot do ourselves efficiently. So yeah, I think that's my very very short comment. No, I, I think that's 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 great. Uh, I, I want to draw out some of the others because I know that. Uh, well, maybe I should. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't put Costas on the on the spot, but since he uh, he challenged me initially, I, I'd be interested to know whether whether he's got infections. And Daniel, I think Marina as well would be interesting. And um, I don't know when he's here as well. Whether whether you want to comment on what is. Um... Uh, personally, I see in a way that the way that we use AI actually is the sort of process how uh, how human brain works. It's just that I don't think that we as humans understand the level of complexity that the human brain has. For example, also when it comes to uh, multi-dimensions, I think right now, of course, if we look at at the machine being able to, uh, to look at multi-dimensional space and analyze it, of course, we are saying it's very overwhelming for a human mind. But if you think about it, that's also the way we we do we, we process information. Yeah, the way we um, we create associations and other things. Yeah. So I don't think it's really that far off. It's just that we are not aware actually of that way of looking at at the world as humans. We don't see them in terms of latent space or you know this vast uh, dimensional space that. Uh, Machine, uh, machines or AIs have, you know. So in that sense, for me, I see it also when I'm when I'm trying to design and I'm trying to break design in in bits and trying to uh, to um, train a machine or an AI to learn those design uh, steps. Then you start to realize actually how complex the human process is. Yeah, the designing uh, process of a human is. Yeah. Then you start to realize that. You know, only for me to start to create classifications and to sort something, it's an extremely complex task. When you try to uh, teach a machine to do that, you realize how complex that is. And for you as a human, 
it's enough only to have some uh, some years of experience and you are able to do that automatically you know so i think it's just a matter that i don't think that we are aware actually of the complexity of our process yeah of our brain process and how we we start to create those kind of um, sorting filters and so on i mean that that's actually one of the kind of comments that uh... Makoto Sei Watanabe makes about um, <clears throat> about our brains that they're black boxes. Um, just yeah. as um, <clears throat> a neural network is a kind of like in the hidden layers of neural network can be completely mysterious and also a black box. So um, uh, uh, he sees them as two black boxes. Um, yeah, I, I have a comment about this. I, I agree with uh, Daniel and also with the other, but it, what I can add to this conversation is that uh, maybe it can be a mistake uh, to believe that AI is only one thing. Uh, and also, we still, as you say, uh, we, we still don't know much about our own brain and our own mind. And uh, there is also a difference between what uh, artificial intelligence is and what artif artificial intelligence can be uh, and how it can evolve. And I would like to uh, think artificial intelligence as a, this idea of augmented mind in a way that can help us to uh, solve uh, things that we uh, today can, cannot. And uh, in this uh, comment, I want to come back to your first comment about artificial intelligence as a mirror of, uh, to understand uh, human intelligence. And I would like to say that maybe, I don't know if it's a mirror, I would like to think that artificial intelligence is more like a door <laughs> to understand, to uh, like an open door that we can, I mean, like a door that we can open to understand uh, new, um, or maybe, I don't know if novelty can be, because I don't know if we can't, uh, because, because think about novelty as something that you have to um, come up every week it could be also not uh, so exciting as well, no? Uh, so, um, yeah, so my, my point is this, that we cannot uh, define artificial intelligence as only one thing. Uh, we have to understand the multiple things and the complexity behind artificial intelligence. So maybe we need more than one definition on our, or, uh, of artificial intelligence. One can be Margaret Bowden definition. Maybe there are certain artificial intelligence that is working in the field to try to only be, uh, only do what mind can do. But there is a lot of other tendencies or, or uh, other lines uh, to, to, to study about artificial intelligence. So that's my, my comment about it. No, I, I think that's a great, great comment. I mean, I will talk a bit more about the different types of AI, but one thing I, this is why I was, I was what I was hoping would come out of it, the ideas that I, you know, I had never thought of the fact that having multiple definitions, I think that would be, that's an interesting thought in itself. Um, but for sure, there are many kinds of AI. Um, and we'll also be talking about later on about the whole thing about extended intelligence as well. Um, uh, the, the door, yes, the door. Yeah, no, I agree in some ways. And in fact, actually the mirror, I'm still trying to kind of find a way of theorizing what that mirror might mean. And I'm kind of looking at the mirror, can the mirror stage and I'm just trying to develop it, even if you're going to use that term, whether it's right or not, you know, I think that's a, that's a, but, but this came out, this, it, I will talk about maybe mentioning this or floating this idea later on about the ideas that sometimes it seems to kind of, it seems to suggest something about how we, how we operate. Is that how we operate? I mean, I'm, uh, um, I mean, one of the issues that I'll talk about later is back propagation. You know, do do brains do but back propagation or something similar? You know, that's one of the issues that's being floated right now. Um, that's a technique where you kind of basically you you adjust the weights by going back retroactively to uh, in order to get a, a, a get closer to the particular um, solution um, or solution space. But no, that's. No, I can be. So let's have any, I don't know, uh, any further comments? I know when you, you kind of, you spend yeah. a lot of your time using it. So yes. um. Um, actually, I think there's a two things AI uh, should do. One is something people's good at, but the AI can do it uh, faster, even better. Um, same as uh, we cannot run faster than a car, right? Cars running faster than us, and we both can run, and this is a thing. And the second thing is that AI can do something people cannot do. Uh, for instance, to searching for different uh, or 
large amount of possibilities because people people's mind yes we can have a lot of creativities but uh, uh, it's limited in a limited time we can only search for certain results and we can only try certain results but the AI don't have doesn't have this barrier it can use the computational uh, power yeah, on cloud whatever can be very um, powerful let's say to get uh, all those results people sometimes cannot think of or cannot calculate out in a limited time. So I think in these two ways, AI can help us. And uh, uh, relate to what, what we are doing in China is um, we're using AI to help architects to um, release from the heavy loads of work. For instance, uh, we recently released uh, a, um, a, a program or, or a small app, which call, we call it uh, Cool Master Plan, something like that. Uh, which means you just upload a uh, sketch of a master plan uh, without any landscape, without any uh, roads, uh, segments, and then the AI can just do the master plan for you with um, proposed uh, landscape, with color, with the roads, with the pavements, etc. So this is something uh, architects might need to spend a lot of time to dealing with the Photoshop or um, illustrator to work with, but now AI can help us to this this kind of a dirty job uh, quicker. And meanwhile, there's other possibilities. For instance, we can draw a sketch, and uh, AI can somehow get uh, some inspiration from this sketch out from what you draw. And this is uh, something um, maybe some junior architects could help the seniors to do but it will spend their time to do the modeling, do the blue form, do the drawings, etc. So I think there's a lot of things, uh, but uh, yeah, as a conclusion, just uh, at the beginning, I said, do something people can do, but can do better, faster, and also do something people might cannot do in such a limited time. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, one of the things I, I mentioned this before in several talks, but I, I was struck once when I was teaching at the AA <clears throat> and there was a, a review, one of Cyril Natalie's students, actually, I think it was. Um, and one of the students, um, he kind of presented his work and he said, well, I looked at the possibilities and there's six. You know, it's kind of like, yeah, okay. And then always it's kind of like six or eight or 10 or, you know, it's interesting how people like four books in architecture, mm -hmm. 10 books in architecture, 10 principles or whatever, they always kind of focus on, on these limited numbers. And, and I, you know, you get, you, you, I mean, and I think the problem is that precisely you have, we know that AI has biases and we'll not talk a lot about that, but I think there are biases in, in human um, decision-making processes. We don't tend to think about the range. And then the next student in this particular review, um, you know, presented his work and he said, listen, I've run this through a computer and, and there are 485 different solutions here. And to be honest, 455 of them are really similar, but, but here they are, you know? And I think that, you know, opening up the solution space is precisely that one of those things. Um, I was also struck by a comment um, that was made by Michal Hansmeier, um, where he saw AI as a kind of news. So when you talk about inspiration, I think the inspiration works both ways in some senses, in the sense that it becomes the possibility of something that is, can be a prompt that can maybe open up, suggest possibilities that go beyond that kind of limited, somewhat biased date, uh, set of, of solution space that we have in our own minds. So I, I completely agree with with, with, with that. Um, yeah, just just a few other comments. Like I think we also have to be clear to understand the distinction between uh, AI as an algorithm and AI as uh, learning and training in a way. Because uh, of course, when you when you design an uh, AI network, uh, a neural network, uh, of course you are in a way mimicking uh, the way that the brain uh, the brain functions. Yeah, uh, but one, once you start to train that network and have like thousands and thousands of examples, then you start to move beyond in a way what humans are able to do. Because let's say that uh, you are. And this is for me, sometimes it's hard, or I, I see that the comparison between humans and AI output is in a way not really the correct comparison because it's almost like to say that a human doctor is less good than an AI doctor. And I don't see the, the comparison to be fair because um, 
you are not applying the same parameters when you evaluate the, um, the human doctor versus the, the AI doctor, let's say. Because when you look at the human doctor, you are talking about uh, one neural network that was able to see, let's say, a thousand examples of identifying, let's say, a skin cancer. But when you talk about an AI, you're talking about uh, millions of samples, yeah? So you talk about the experience of thousands of, of doctors, yeah? So it's a completely different scale then. So you can say then safely, I think that AI, when it comes to algorithm, mimics in a way what the brain does, yeah? But then the scale of it, like when you start to train it, is a completely different than thing, yeah? Because as human, even if you, you are, if you are able to process a lot of information, you cannot process it at that scale that AI does, yeah? Yeah, and I, yeah, I think it's uh, from that point of view. I think maybe kind of complementary in some senses to what to what we can do. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, can, I, can I also jump? Sorry. <laughs> to me? Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I just want to jump into kind of. Uh, so I I I feel like AI is still. Uh, we should look at AI still as a as a tool uh, for humans because uh, I think. We are still in a in an infancy and still in a in a very uh, early stage of learning how how to use uh, these really powerful tools, um, um, and we are I think a lot of cases we are trying to learn the creativity uh, coming from the abuse of these tools and a lot of uh, cases such as like uh, a a lot of like uh, work. Um, Daniel showed yesterday also, um, uh, such as these works are, uh, we are still using AI to uh, kind of find the ways for us to, uh, for humans to try to uh, look for different possibilities of creativity and creative solutions. So um, it's if we just merely looking at it as a, a replacement of human, I think there are lots of limitations of looking at it. Um, but I think we should be uh, uh, like not apologetic to abusing it and just really try to see what different kinds of uh, tools with AI can do for us. And I think we are still in a very early stage to really understand what this can do. Um, even some different solutions or different uh, network structures, such as like deep learning uh, versus um, other, other AI structures. I think we really don't really understand what's really happening in the background. Um, but we are still, uh, we are very aggressively trying to use it. And I, I think, yeah, I think uh, the way we are doing right now is trying to seek for creativity. Um, can, I, can I just, yep. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, I just want to go back for a second to the uh, Neil presentation and uh, and congratulations. It was uh, really uh, interesting and really well constructed as always. Um, you started talking about, about um, swarm intelligence and emergence, and um, and I think that is uh, interesting because it's uh, what is emergence. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's about. Uh, constructing a system, basically, and using uh, the, 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 those tools about constructing a system that then, or a process that then is uh, generating an object that could be an architectural object or a design object, whatever. What is uh, interesting to me is that uh, as architect, we, we have been always, and, and especially now with uh, digital tools, uh, focusing on uh, on the process more than on the final outcome, and why we have been uh, uh, fascinated uh, so much uh, about that emergence or not predictable. Uh, it's it's because we are creative people. We are basically artists in a way, and what we are interested in, what we are looking in a way, it's a sort of independence or 
uh, autonomy or somehow distinction of the outcome uh, towards what we what we can directly figure out with our creativity, with our imagination. And um, so I think that uh, asking ourselves uh, too much about uh, what AI can do or will be will be able to do in uh, in the future is probably the wrong way to be intelligent in uh, formulating our question because what we are actually looking for is a sort of uh, not predictable um, uh, outcome that an AI can produce or or a non predictable. Uh, quality or performance that an AI could do in the, in the future. I think that what uh, I'm, um, I'm also, again, coming back to your presentation, at a certain point you said uh, two really interesting things. One is, uh, is, uh, is about uh, uh, the interest in the platform and not in the tool, so creating a, a um, you said the stimulator of conversation as a way of teaching. Uh, and, and you said that basically you, you found interesting that uh, you may bring people from uh, different background and also different uh, approaches, knowledges, experience and so on, and still be uh, really have a really productive and interesting conversation. And actually it's, uh, it's what, I think it is more interesting uh, when um, exactly about the effect of combining different uh, backgrounds. When we uh, when we show about the a swarm system, a swarm system is based on a sort of uh, uh, homogeneity and continuity, and the emergence is somehow not predictable, but uh, based on a continuous kind of performance. And I think in the moment you, you can combine uh, different situation, it becomes most, more powerful as a process of uh, uh, novelty. It becomes radical as a form of novelty. And so to conclude, I think that artificial intelligence in this is really interesting because it works in a different way compared to uh, emergent system because it's really combinatory as a, as a form of a, a process and procedure. You can really combine situation there uh, in terms of structure of information are radically different. And I think that this is uh, something that uh, uh, it's really fascinating. The effect of uh, working on a radical, and uh, not predictable uh, situation and performance using these new um, and tools or, or processes. Uh, can I add something to uh, Nicola's comment and also Van use? Uh, so um, I, I want to also uh, agree with uh, classification then when you put forward. One is about the, the speed, and I, I think the car analogy is a great one. And uh, if we go back to even uh, Gary Kasparov's theme uh, with Deep Blue, uh, there's uh, this interesting comparison that Kasparov was able to uh, think about uh, two moves per second versus Deep Blue was able to look at uh, 270,000 moves per second, right? So definitely the optimization uh, is something that uh, as also Theodorus put forward is, uh, is a component that uh, we cannot uh, you know, disagree with. Uh, so then think about this incredible diagram that then uh, was produced by AlphaGo uh, in terms of the uh, number of decisions that uh, the uh, system was able to put forward is extremely fascinating. At the same time, uh, the, the comment about uh, also looking at it as something that maybe the human cannot, go, uh, cannot do. Uh, if we think about um, the AlphaGo uh, system, uh, what made it incredibly uh, powerful was the concept of self-play, which is something that humans by nature wouldn't really think about because let's say the way that the grandmasters were trained was by uh, studying other games but, and uh, playing with everybody else versus the, the system was able to do self-play. So this is a completely inherently different way of thinking about uh, 
uh, let's say database construction and also probability uh, extension. So I think um, having this uh, two hats, uh, maybe uh, when we're thinking about what it could and could not and projecting forward some of our uh, maybe ways of thinking about, um, uh, let's say explaining system could be handy uh, and it might help us in maybe uh, some of the projections that are uh, coming from maybe our own uh, way or maybe limited way of understanding uh, addressing uh, problem solving. Yeah, I I sorry. Go ahead. No, just, just one thing, maybe, maybe then you can come back to the Bayana point. But no, I, I'm, I mean, I, I'm still defining myself as an architect. And um, one thing that I was thinking about my uh, what, what I do, for example, to, uh, is that maybe I would like to add like other two levels to the conversation, because we we are talking about uh, intelligence, which can be sometimes like some idea of control under the, the, that uh, conception. So I would like to add two levels more to the conversation. What could be, uh, for example, the idea of cleverness? So when the first one that we started is intelligence, second one could be cleverness and uh, um, Third one could be like certain idea of ingenuity that we already have, because in my uh, particular perception as an architect, uh, I can see that we are like uh, going through all these three levels. Uh, and um, maybe we can, in a way, um, understand that this engagement with all these three levels uh, can be like a kind of certain uh, uh, or sort of uh, cultural activism or something behind the idea of intelligence, uh, not so to open the conversation, maybe it's more related with uh, Nicolo comment, uh, but uh, yeah, I would like to add these other two levels to the conversation if it's possible. Yeah, I, I just want to add a little thing. I, I don't think uh, AI is not uh, controllable or it's uh, unpredictable because um, uh, there's some ways, at least the we are trying, I mean, with the, our company, we're trying to control it based on uh, the database you're setting up and uh, based on the uh, some of the rules because we think AI is not just the one or two algorithms is um, um, kind of a collection of uh, several models, several algorithm models and several different um, uh, sets of parameters um, uh, models in different conditions. So it will face different uh, tasks to get the different uh, controls. Uh, so at, so uh, at least in our uh, tests or in our products, we, we see there's a possibility to control it. Uh, sometimes combined with rules, sometimes um, just uh, needing the algorithm, for instance, the reinforcement learning, how you set up the rules, or for CNN, you, how you using different database, all these kind of things. So. It can be predict, yeah. And meanwhile, I also think uh, this is a link to how we think about creativity and how we think about architects. This um, uh, what we do as architects. I think architects' work is not just for searching for ideas or creativities, or but we are more like, uh, from my understanding, is we are more like um, um, as a operational researcher or we do operational balance. So we, we try to understand what is matters in this case or this project and try to make uh, our position, make our choice. And this part, I don't think AI can replace human beings, replace architects, but uh, AI can do give some suggestions. For instance, what is the best performance options and what is the uh, different uh, um, analyzing results could get out from different uh, uh, schemes, etc. 
So I think the final decision is, will be always taken by the architects, but the AIs can provide different uh, possibilities for us. Yeah, I think that's something uh, we, we used to do, but uh, not doing really well. For instance, I was in OMA and we have a lot of uh, uh, interns, junior architects, they do really like a, dozens of the options for the project architects, even the partners to select out from. I think this part, this, this procedure can be somehow helped by the AI at least, but the higher level uh, making decisions I don't think AI can really help, at least in this uh, short period, like three to five years or even 10 years. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to, 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 to react on this last, last comment. I, I also very much believe that, you know, uh, all, these, uh, all these models, uh, especially in offices like OMA, uh, with uh, with a lot of interns producing endless amount of of preliminary models, I I believe that it's also part of the folklore of the uh, of the architecture. It's a bit sad to say, but personally, I don't believe that it makes such a big difference at the end. It's uh, maybe maybe again, it's uh, yeah, it's a it's a, a pure belief. It's almost a kind of religious uh, behavior, believing that uh, having uh, 50 different uh, foam, blue foam models in front of our eyes is going to make a big difference. So for sure, first uh, AI could, could help producing these things with uh, far less human, uh, human needs. So uh, it would be a, a, a very welcome optimization in any case. But I think I, I really wonder, wonder if it's even necessary to use AI for that kind of thing, because ultimately, I'm not even sure that those things are, are more than, than a kind of religious belief that is well established in architectural practices. And that is maybe also a part of of a kind of sociological um, uh, hierarchy within architectural offices. Uh, I mean, it's both it's both a, a, a comment and a question. You know, uh, again, I'm not one hundred percent convinced by all of that in traditional architectural offices. And uh, and if uh, and as one you said, in any case, uh, it could be replaced by artificial intelligence. This is functional. If I, if I can, I can add some thoughts uh, on on this point. Like I, just a minor minor thing. I don't believe like generative design with let's say deep learning even these simple systems is viable right now. But let's say like it's not as close as we think it is. Like it's very different to have a style gun, you know, hallucinating paintings. It's very different just to ask a style gun to take you know, some constraints into account and generate something that works and is feasible. But I want to go back to the creativity. I think all of you almost like discuss creativity in one way or another. And as the as the focus, let's say that maybe AI should not be a tool, like use it for creativity. I think that's very interesting and also a bit difficult right now. And I want to go back to what Neil said. And I want to be the, because I'm not an architect, I want to be the devil's advocate. So please don't hate me when he was discussing about the death of the profession. And the, the whole idea is that, you know, AI will come and replace us and creativity will be gone. And, and I think as, a dev, as this devil's advocate, I would say, I would suggest that this has already happened. Like my problem with, with this statement is that we are assuming we are creative right now, right? And I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, brilliant architects in this panel and you know, huge firms, or I'm talking about the, the whole scene, let's say the whole scene of architecture, let's say, or urban design, right? Just walk out in, in, in the streets. I, I can go out in this city, around me there's probably 100 projects, right? 100 high town. They're all the same. Same layout, same facade, same inside, same shape, same massing, same for the same reasons, built for, you know? So maybe what my view when I first started, let's say, working with design intelligence or like AI, was that maybe it can help us, you know, go over this, this, this hump, this problem that we have right now, that we are not really creative. And 
we, we are not really approaching. And for that, it's not that we as humans or designers, we are not. It's just the way the project, maybe the real, real world is structured, is not letting you be creative, right? There is no time for design, is there? Like, or maybe there is no budget or there, there's no like will to do it. So I do agree that it can be a huge boost to creativity. You know, depending on how how we how we use it, how how we achieve that is an open question. Obviously, like is a, I'm not sure how. I would suggest that it, it wouldn't be just creating things and we review it. I would suggest that we need a more mixed initiative approach. But yeah, I think I think that's a question. So that's sort of my daily advocate. I wonder what others think. I, about. I just wanted to build on Theodore's comment with regards to the fact that we are through an, going through a very important moment because once. Let's say, uh, and it was clear a few years ago when um, the Saskins wrote this book about the future of the professions, that every particular domain is individually and eventually, I guess, collectively looking at how AI will impact their particular uh, field. And so once I see this as a potential, I mean, potentially we have to look at the, 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 the danger of once the, the technologies get optimized, that all this gets internalized into tools like, and I think we, this was already discussed in digital futures, like, is AI the next grasshopper or is that another grasshopper and so on? So I think this particular period is, is the most fruitful one because this has not been developed yet and it has not been yet internalized. And so we have the chance to look at the process as opposed to the product. I think it was Daniel who mentioned that uh, a little, little bit earlier. So, uh, and that, that has the, the potential to really open up the door to understanding things about human creativity and and. In, in general, creativity, let, let, let's say, right? And what's interesting is like, even the way we define intelligence, uh, in a recent paper, I think it was Francois Cholet who, who, who spoke about, about the agent's ability to define specific tasks, but in a wide range of environments. And so within those two facets of defining intelligence, not artificial intelligence, but intelligence in general, we begin to understand that the creativity lies in that second part of the statement, in the ability to generalize which AI yet does not fully fully have or does not have at all uh, so i think uh, basically uh, all, well, my, my, my main point was that it, this is a kind of critical time to be looking at not just the outcomes but also uh, the structure of this process and how that can refer back to our own kind of uh, restructuring of both profession and i think as neil pointed out earlier the education the artificial education it's, it's kind of i mean if i jump in again um, we, we should also ask the question, as you said, about creativity, but, but what, what it is in terms of uh, mental process, of course, but also what it is um, in, as, let's say, as perceived, as seen by the people in the street, for example. Uh, if you walk in the street, if, if a, a layman, not an architect, of course, but uh, if a layman, a regular person, is what works in the street and uh, see a building which is a bit weird, um, then it will consider its creativity, uh, which is uh, probably a very, a very poor definition of creativity, of course, but still it's a definition of it. Uh, and I would say most, most buildings, most architects, when they, when they create, they apply nothing else than that. And I think this kind of creativity is not even, is not even, let's say, we don't even need artificial intelligence to mimic this kind of creativity. Just some sort of randomness is enough to mimic this creativity. Because again, uh, what, what people uh, do when they create is that they just do a couple of of uh, weird, they just add a couple of weirdness, a couple of, of a bit of uh, strangeness to what is usually uh, square, simple, rectangle, etc. This kind of boring shape, uh, and it's exactly what was said before, you know, by Theodorus. He said that when he goes in the street, most of what he sees are the same buildings, they all look the same, etc. And then, again, you would consider creativity as something which precisely doesn't look similar or doesn't look like uh, the next 1,000 buildings. If there is one building which stands out 
from this 1000, then maybe you will say, oh, this building has some creativity embedded into it. And again, I'm not saying it's a definition of creativity, of course, and I hope it's not. I'm just saying that this is what people consider uh, to uh, architectural creativity to be. And this is also what happens in the, in the society at large. Again, it's not, it's strangeness. And, uh, and the, the, the miss, let's say, uh, they take strangeness from creativity, which is a big mistake, but it's, a, it's what it is. And, and for that, uh, again, I think the debate can, can start being interesting because if we look creativity, if we consider this is creativity, then again, you don't need intelligence. You just need a bit of randomness into any kind of processes. I think yeah. that's really interesting. Uh, uh, and, and what Philip is talking about is about the formal creativity, I, I, I would understand. Um, um, but it yes. reminds me of uh, of a a YouTube uh, video that I watched. Uh, it, it was about uh, uh, I think it was a, about a paper, and uh, there was uh, some uh, some game uh, AI agents uh, are trained for with with like AI uh, to re to win a game, and they they were kind of learning and learning how to win uh, this game. And they found really creative solutions, how to win the game that people, normally a game, human gamer won't really uh, uh, figure out. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think, um, I think uh, we can really think about creativity in a way uh, to see that how, um, AI can learn different creative solutions instead of uh, just merely talking about understanding creativity as a, a formal solutions for uh, our architectural aesthetic, say. Um, but I think there are also lots of different potentials that uh, a, uh, AI's point of view to kind of test out different things and find different uh, creative solutions uh, that maybe can inspire human. But I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, humans should make the final decisions to really um, uh, clarify or, or uh, uh, justify what is good for us. But there are a lot of, uh, there are certainly this potential that we can get inspired by AI's creativity. Uh, that's how I understand the creativity. You're, yeah. you're right. I, can, I can say something no, about sorry, it. There, there is that, um, I mean, creativity is not starting from scratch. No. Uh, and uh, what I believe about creativity, also yesterday, uh, watching, um, or uh, yes, watching Daniel uh, lecture, there is never uh, starting from scratch. I mean, our uh, capability, uh, human capability in a way of uh, uh, create uh, links between different things. That's what uh, creativity does from my point of view. And that's why, uh, for example, we can link, uh, uh, I don't know, different disciplines to create something new. So uh, in my, from my point of view, creativity is not the bureaucratization of the variation. Uh, creativity, I mean, to try to <laughs> come back to uh, one uh, novelty every week because it's almost impossible. What I believe about creativity is that you have like a huge spectrum about or a huge branch of things that you that you that you know, even as a as an architect, uh, and then you can uh, um, link uh, cinema with music with uh, architecture with uh, artificial intelligence, if you want. I'm sorry, my, my dog is barking. Uh, but no, only that, that the creativity is not uh, just only starting from scratch, it's more than that. It's, uh, it's like what happened with Art Nouveau, with the beginning of art and craft at the very end of 19th century, what is happening nowadays. 
with artificial intelligence in architecture. You know, we start by experimenting things, by applying different kind of tools, and it creates new shapes and, and probably uh, many kind of, by the way, formerly very interesting outputs. I have no, nothing against that in itself, but probably, probably the real creativity that we are looking for when we when we make use of artificial intelligence in architecture is another kind of creativity. Uh, it might be the kind of creativity that is that is invented by AlphaGo uh, to to beat Lee Seidel uh, at the Go games. You know, at the, I think this is probably this kind of creativity that we want, and uh, it's extremely complex. It's a creativity which, which means that uh, it, it's about inventing new strategies. It's uh, about inventing, inventing new methods, inventing new, new new models, new models of construction, new models of assembly, new models of of. Uh, uh, logistics uh, in, in you know in 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 the re in the realization of, of an architectural project. So I believe this kind of creativity is, is definitely the, the, the most in interesting one, and that's the one we we are looking for. But again, that one is extremely uh, difficult to achieve, and it's going to take years, of course. But I believe it will happen. Maybe not in one or two years, but not so f not so far away. Neither it will it it will happen. And and pro I mean let's let's think about it. You know, as a kind of uh, 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 thought experiment, we can perfectly imagine that we we give some project to an artificial intelligence, and this artificial intelligence, uh, alike what happened with AlphaGo, or with with the latest version, which uh, which are uh, completely capable of discovering the, the the rules of the games, so we can imagine that an artificial intelligence will not only create interesting shapes, but most mo but most of all, it will it will discover discover the full methodology of creation uh, that architects are using when they do architectural design when they design a project. It's exact. I mean, we can say a, a, a methodology for design is no different from uh, an old-style Atari, Atari game. You know, it's a game. There's a lot of constraints. There's a lot of events, etc. But there's also a few rules uh, saying that if you if you face this kind of constraints, then you have to do this. If you face this other Kind of constraints and uh, to do that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a kind of of games that we that we were playing at in the 80s. You know these Atari uh, uh, arcade arcade games, and I believe that uh, artificial intelligence is nowadays perfectly capable of discover, discovering how you play these kind of of games without even. Uh, uh, knowing the rules at the beginning, it discovers the rules. It discovers the the smartest method, the smartest strategy, etc., to play this game. And if we could consider that artificial intelligence in architecture will be fully complete when when it will have come with this kind of result, you know. You have an artificial intelligence. It's learning what is the design process at large, a complete, uh, uh, an extensive design process, and then when you will give a few sketches or whatever, or maybe the program, or maybe what the client want, then the artificial intelligence intelligence will design a full uh, a project by going through all the different steps that you, we usually experiment in the design process, but also in a more creative and original ways, because for sure it will not necessarily follow exactly what we used to follow as human beings. This is exactly what happened with AlphaGo again. And so far, 
we are very far from that. So far, what we are doing in artificial intelligence, with artificial intelligence in architecture, has nothing to do with what AlphaGo is doing. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, I totally agree. Uh, Philippe was uh, what you uh, were saying, and actually it was uh, precisely what I meant at the at the beginning when I was saying that as architect we were interested in emergence because we were interested in the idea of. Uh, uh, creating a design process that were then generating objects instead of designing directly objects. And I think in the moment we're going to have the possibility to, um, to construct and um, an artificial intelligence capable of uh, creating process that then are generating objects, we are actually uh, uh, going to have a a fundamental step in creativity, since we were talking about creativity, that is not using artificial intelligence in a creative way, but actually give creative tools directly to artificial intelligence, that is artificial intelligence being itself creative. Uh, even though uh, going back again to your comment before I say, I have to say that I kind of uh, uh, slightly disagree with the, your um, idea of uh, creativity as uh, randomness. I think it's, uh, it's one kind of creativity. Then we have uh, creativity in uh, refinement, in system systematization. Uh, your uh, definition or your call of creativity as a randomness, it's, uh, it kind of sounds to me as an aesthetic kind of a creativity instead of a performance kind of creativity. So I think that it is correct, but it's just one part of, uh, of, uh, of what a creativity could be. Of, of course, uh, what I said is that, is that creativity as randomness is what people see. What most people exactly. in the street do see. But obviously, uh, this, is what, this is not what architects should do. I, I mean, I just kind of just maybe step in. I, um, I can see that this, the, the session on creativity is going to be a creative one. I mean, one thing I will say is that it's kind of like I, I, I floated this idea, and I think Manos was, was at the time that maybe creativity could be compared to emergence in some way. There's, or at least maybe we could rethink the notion of creativity. And certainly now that we've just been looking at Margaret Bowden, I think you know, she is famous as the person who has. Um, try to articulate what creativity is. And I, I think that interesting is what she, she said, I think it needs to be re-interrogated re right now, but I, I think maybe we should leave that till the, the session on creativity. One thing I will say in terms of kind of the discussion about emergence is that what became clear to me is, she, is out of this interaction here. I mean, it's kind of interesting that you, in some ways it is a kind of swarm intelligence. Literally we have like, you know, individuals, it's almost like a brain. This is like almost like operating as a brain with these, these people who contribute, everyone contributing in some way to this, this discussion. Um, I, you know, that's that's. It's almost like a demonstration itself of of, the, of these things. Um, can I can I, one thing I want to do is because uh, Eleanor's uh, got a problem with her uh, microphone and she can't uh, can't ask a question. So I want just going to read out a question from the chat, and then I want then I want to try and get to see if we can get Costas involved in some way. Uh, so this is a question from Eleanor. Um, going back to Wan Yu's point, do do we really uh, can we really control AI? Uh, uh, we could already see a, a basic subjective level of a consciousness in AI systems, basic essential personal history, identity, me memories. After watching HBO series Westworld, we start questioning, can machines have P consciousness? Uh, what is qualia? Is artificial qualia, do, do, do they, does artificial qualia exist? What is the measurement of, of it? Would we be able to control it? Uh, will artificial emotional intelligence exist? That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, another example, when AI uh, won poker game, um, poker involves not only te technical skills uh, like chess, but also creative skills, such as acting and psychological aspects. Is, are machines becoming in independently creative, away from human control, or even uh, can they outbid humans? Um, a lot of questions there. I, I mean, just lay them on the table. I, I, one thing I will say, I, you know, I want to go back to the kind of issue that, that, that Theodore raised, and uh, um, I, 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 the idea that actually, oh, are we that creative? I mean, uh, that's a, um, a really interesting kind of question. We're convinced we are, but you know, I think when we start interrogating it, we don't, we don't necessarily, we find that we maybe not so much. So, and I don't want to go 
I said, maybe stop going down the rabbit hole of creativity because we, we have a session on it in, in a, a, a few weeks time. But I will say the one thing is that I think one, one of the issues, again, this comes back to the kind of question about how AI can become a mirror or whatever the word is, right? Um, there's, a, there's a technique that uh, was developed um, by and I've, um, uh, Ahmed El, El Gamal, I think it's called his name, um, who, where he uses, he's developed a technique called creative adversarial networks. Where, and I'll we'll talk about this more and I'll show some of the images that he's done when we come to that. But he basically has a way of thinking about creativity is like, you know, you, you, it's kind of combination of keeping to an existing kind of model of things and offering a slight variation of it, which is precisely the way that I've spoken about it for some for some time. And I, I would simply say, you know, are we that creative? And I think one of the issues that we um, we, we overlook um, uh, is, is to what extent we mimicry or imitation is precisely part of the logic of how we operate. Um, uh, uh, the, the, in the sense that, um, uh, I mean, some of, I won't, again, I'll maybe say these comments for more detail later on, but um, that, that there is a, a way of thinking that is to say that, that all forms of, uh, of human operation are indeed a form of, of imitation. Now that may strike you as being shocking, and it was absolutely shocking to my students at Columbia years ago when I, I raised that kind of voice and they said, what do you mean? We're creative individuals. And I then said to them, okay, well, um, maybe uh, um, uh, next time you're in the elevator going from the kind of the, 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 the seminar room in the, in the bottom to the, to the, the studio at the top, have a look around you and see who's not wearing black. And of course, the only person not wearing completely black was Bernard Shumi, who had a red scarf, and they would tease him mercilessly for having a red scarf, you know? I mean, so anyway, I, you know, I think the question about human creativity is a really interesting and important one, but, but I, I would say that just to kind of have a quote from Adorno, who says that basically humans become humans in the first place by imitating other humans. I mean, that's a, that's, so we, we, there's a whole, again, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but there's a whole issue, I think, about whether we are as creative as we want to think we are. Um, so I, I want to just try and maybe to, to maybe I could I don't want to pick on on Costas but it'd be great to have Costas he's a very valued individual and I also see Anna's got a hand up so um, uh, yeah Anna do you want to go ahead? Sure, yeah. I was just wondering about can you hear me clearly because my microphone yes. yeah yeah so we, we were talking about so we we are imitating so creative we're not creating anything. Uh, is, is that what you meant that we're, we're not creating anything but we're as marina said we're linking things and then by making these associations we're coming up with a new thing that is not really a creating something but could we so could we use ai to gather all these links to create to actually create something that we can't create so so it's, it's not a question, but it's something I think we can't really talk about AI without uh, talking about creativity as we're going to discuss further. But my, my question is that the replacing humans or death of the death of the architect, you know, does it see if we're not creating, uh, if we're mimicking and uh, mimicking and linking things, could we use AI to make something that we couldn't do. I, I, just, just to clarify, I, I don't think that 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 the human creativity is completely imitation, not at all, but it is based in imitation. That's a, an argument that's longer one in, in going on than I do in camouflage. So, so I don't think it's, I wouldn't limit it to that, but I just think, I don't think we're creative as we think we are, let's put it that way. Um, maybe I can bring in Costas um, in Shanghai. Uh, um... Yeah, in Shanghai, which is pretty late right now, but um, uh, it's a great conversation here, and I'm very uh, drawn into it, even though it's kind of late. Uh, I remember, this is just to give you some perspective of uh, how I feel about what you're saying, is that um, I remember there was like three years ago with uh, Neil, we were in the hotel, I think Wan Yu was there in Xinhua, remember? And uh, actually, I was very fascinated with uh, Neil's uh, uh, colorful uh, shoes. Remember, you had these uh, <laughs> yellow shoes. But basically, what I was trying to say is that uh, at that point, we were in China. And uh, I am in China, too. And uh, one of the fascinating things that I found in China is that it's a whole different culture. And uh, they see the world from a very different point of view. When I was in America, I was seeing the world from a Greek point of view into the American culture. And now I'm seeing it from a Greek point of view into the uh, 
Chinese culture. And I realized at some point that everything is about the language that we use to understand the things that we you know, see in the world. And uh, right now you're talking about definitions. It's very interesting to, uh, you know, you, you made this argument about what, uh, you know, uh, uh, Margaret said about the machine and the uh, thinking and the mind. And I think it's very important that since we have also three guys here, which are from Greece and uh, three guys, which I think are from China to kind of like uh, brainstorm a little bit what the words that we use mean at the very, very bottom level. In other words, like you say, a machine. What is a machine? What does the word machine mean? How do you understand it? How does it actually you conceive its, 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 its ontology? What is it? And uh, what is intelligence in general? What is, what is the mind? Again, again, it's very interesting if you look into the Chinese definition of the word mind or the word machine, there's certain symbols that they use. And these symbols actually mean something very deep. And the Greeks also, we have this etymology of how we define a word. And these words also mean something very important to us, which we understand. And we understand in a very kind of strange way. And I'm thinking that if we combine these uh, concepts of language and define what we really mean, what does the word mean itself? That would be like very useful. And I would be very uh, uh, interested in, you know, contributing a few things that we've been working here in China from uh, um, a, um, again, definitional point of view. What is these things? What do they mean? Uh, what is intelligence in general? That, that's kind of like what I'm, I'm, again, I was, again, I, I, I bring in this all in the concept of uh, uh, Neil uh, trying to, uh, uh, you know, create a question. What is AI? And again, what is artificial and what is intelligence? That's things that you have to actually, uh, I, I would uh, be interested in discussing. Yeah, no, I, I, think, uh, I mean, I think we think we'd be, we'd be great, great to discuss that and great to see what you're doing as well at some point. I think when it's part of this platform, I hopefully will people will be contributing and showing showing us what they what they what they're actually producing and so on. Um, just to say one thing, one thing I remember about that particular meeting we had in uh, in Shanghai with uh, Lu Xingwan and Wan Yuhun and Costas and Heijin, uh, I think Heijin wasn't there, uh, was. Cost us at one point. He had a we had a, a plate of, of biscuits. Well, in America they call them cookies, right? And he was he was using it to talk about the what AI can do. And he he took one of the biscuits or cookies and put it behind his back and said, "Just because we can't see it doesn't mean to say it's not there." And I think that's the to my mind was that was a great lesson in education. Now, that's what AI does. It kind of opens us up to things beyond our own, our own, our own biases. And, and one of the things that I will say, and I, I will go, and I want to talk about this and, and when we come to that session um, on neuroscience is actually in some ways, again, I think we can see that we are trained in a certain sort of way as architects in a way that is actually not so dissimilar to a neural network to perceive the world in a certain sort of way. And that is, I think architectural education is in some way blinkering us to think about the world in a, in a certain way. Um, I just, I just wanted to say that it's interesting what Costa said kind of rings uh, a bell around the, the sort of cultural intelligence that is encoded within our linguistic representation of things. And it kind of reminded me of an example from his book on permutation design regarding, for example, the word uh, statue, you know, and, and the way that you kind of begin to assume a different dimension uh, when you translate it from, you know, the, the Greek word which relates to it's called aralma, you know, and it relates to the actual sensation that is invoked when, when you look at, at a statue, which is that of delight. Now, when, when you translate it into other languages, you know, starting from Latin and into English, it really uh, refers to some more literal connotation of something which is standing up. And so um, I want to just bring this up in relation to um, an example, for example, uh, which uh, for, I think Daniel uh, likes to mention about translating um, you know, to, 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 to prevent this kind of mode collapse uh, situation when a network is trying to uh, mimic rather than actually imagine um, new, new kind of um, samples after, 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 after training, uh, it, it has to kind of prove that it, can, it has learned in both directions. So when you're translating from one language into another, you also have to translate back into the original language to, to 
basically demonstrate that you learned the meaning of the words and not just the, uh, the mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the combination of letters, so to speak. And I think this is very important because you can talk about the bias and other things in, in AI. Right. So what we're doing right now in uh, Shanghai, we're doing a class on AI for kids, five, six, seven years old. And it's very interesting because kids don't have the baggage that we have. Like they don't know what's going on. They have only logic. And they're very, very logical about things. And it's very interesting to actually try to teach them programming and try to teach them also how to define things. And then define in a very, very smart and intelligent way, but it's very out of our realm of things. And I think that's a very way of understanding what AI is from kids, from the kids' point of view. And also to see how they create things and what they do with the code and with the um, you know different concepts that I teach them. And uh, you know it's, it's a different way of looking into AI from a um, kind of like a, a primitive point of view, again where the language is not that important. It's more like the logic behind things. Cool. But again, the, the, the language is also a, another tool that you start to uh, get when you get into cross-cultural things. When there's like, you know, you know, uh, one culture talking to another culture, we have to define, what do you mean by that? W what does that mean to you? And then you start getting like deeper into the understanding. Then you realize that at the end of the day, you were just talking about an illusion. You thought that you knew what you knew, but you didn't really know. And that is the whole important thing that I think we are supposed to be decoding in the uh, academic level is to find, okay, where's the, uh, uh, the superficial stuff versus the ontological thing? What is the deep meaning of things versus what appears to be? Because there's a lot of appearances and a lot of words that we use that are very loaded and they mean so many things that everybody understands differently. And at the end, we get confused. And I think there's no reason for that. We can just actually go back to the basic, basic primitive things, the very archetypal things, the very, uh, as uh, uh, Vermeuseau said, uh, the, 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 the principle, the um, archetypes. Or go back to the kids and ask the kids, what do, you, what do you understand by this thing? Like our own kids or like, you know, you know four or five, six year old kids. And this would be actually very enlightening to me, and that's what I'm doing here right now in, in, in China. I'm talking to Chinese people, other people, other cultures, and also to kids. That's my uh, Just to say, uh, I mean, Shamin is, is probably is not, not here any longer, but Shamin has a, has a son, I think, who's, who's, who's six years old, who's coding in Python. Um, I know if you just to get yeah. a comment about that. I mean, They're one great. of the things, I, I, just to kind of, as, this is more kind of philosophical question, we've got a, next semester, we're going to have a course on kind of philosophy and things, but one of the issues that Walter Benjamin would, would raise, that, that actually, is that translation is itself actually impossible. There's a certain incommensurability between different cultures. In other words, you can have a word and you can translate it. Let's take the word bread and, and let's translate it into, um, into, um, uh, into French and you get pan, into, into German, you got brot. But what the Germans mean by brot and what the French mean by pan is very different to what we mean by, by, by bread. I mean, in, in Germany, you get this solid black, you know, things you can build buildings with, actually. That's what they call bread, right? I'm sure Jörg knows about this. And, and then, it, it, I mean, and, and, in, and even in, in the States, you know, I come across and I, I have the same word bread, English, right? And this kind of sourdough. And I, you know, it's it, so it does, I think in some sense, at one point you can never translate. It's incommensurable in some ways. I agree. I think yeah, this idea also of very crucial word. Why don't you get into like complicated words like um, mind? What does the word mind mean? And uh, you know, in Chinese, there's a word for that, and there's a symbol, and it has certain characteristics. And if you go back into the history, you find what they mean when they say mind. Like the Greeks, we use the word nous, which is the uh, which is coming from the word nemo, means to distribute things, to arrange things. Arranging things is what the mind is. It's an arranging machine in a way. So when we say mind, it's not about how I think and what I, it's my personal opinion about things. That's not what a mind is. The mind is about a mechanism that arranges things. If you go into the word itself and you find what it means. And again, in Chinese, you have a different word, which is a kind of like a very interesting symbol that means something else. And uh, that I think is very useful because then you uh, decode the uh, complexity of the terms by getting into the primitive uh, um, understandings of things. And that actually, then you start resynthesizing things back and you come with new concepts and you realize that in the beginning, you just didn't know what you're talking about. And now you know, because you know how 
it is to go all the way down to the uh, bottom of it. Either the bottom is the language bottom or the kid's bottom or the, 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 the beginning of the human mind. When the, the mind starts to think, which is the kind of like kids or baby age, or again, the primitive, how the people in the past, like the ancient Chinese, the ancient Greeks, the ancient whatever uh, cultures were thinking about. And then you go back and say, okay, there when they were like so pure, they were thinking this way. So let's go back and see, can we synthesize back into a new concept of uh, philosophical investigation so we can understand really what AI is. Otherwise, we're just talking about something that we don't know and we're confusing ourselves with one another. I, I think that's my personal yeah. opinion. I, I think, I'm just wondering whether we should- I don't want to stop or interrupt in some way, but maybe I could just put another um, kind of a few comments on the table and, and go back to my PowerPoint to show a couple of things. Um, because I think what is AI, I mean, actually we have the advantage, most of us here have been very familiar with, with, with what it is or reasonably familiar, but maybe some of the audience are not so familiar. So I'm going to go back to kind of like just a very briefly and, and hopefully get back to this conversation and uh, uh, just make a few more comments just to go and feed something into the discussion. Um, uh, and I, I just want to, from, uh, I just want to, put this kind of on the table here as a kind of comment and we'll talk more about and you know networks at some point but to say what what we're getting here is this kind of human versus ai is um the term neuron is taken from the left hand side the synapses and neurons of the brain and it's inspired by it but really not all close to it um in in some ways in fact actually uh, Melanie Mitchell doesn't like using the word um, neuron, she uses the word units instead, just to go and get beyond it. Um, at the same time, you know, I, I just think it is a, a opening up some kind of questions to what, we, what we're talking about. So what well, on the left hand side, you can see how we, we get these kind of these different layers in, in, a, in a neural network, the input layer, the output layer, and in the middle, these kind of hidden layers, and the kind of processes going through, and the synapses will tend to kind of the weighting will will readjust itself. It will learn in some senses um, and readjust itself as we as we go through. So I want to then send. Them, um, well, I'll skip this to say you know strong AI versus. Weak. This is another one of the distinctions to be made. On the left hand side, um, uh, 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 Sophia the robot, the humanoid robot, which many many people working in AI think is a complete con, complete con, because uh, she gives the appearance of having. Um, uh, uh, kind of awareness of having um, um, uh, uh, consciousness, but actually doesn't, and and uh, that's that's one of the kind of the key the key issues. And I just want to first of all put this out there is that just for those who don't know, um, AGI, artificial general intelligence, is the term that's used for when AI gets consciousness, if it ever will. I mean, there are other, there's a debate about that, whether it's relevant and whether we need to have consciousness, uh, and and whether indeed uh, uh, consciousness is a is a is really just a product of, of increasing um, intelligence or whether it's something completely different. And that I don't want to get into right now, but to say that is the, the term that's been used is AGI when we when computers will get um, uh, um, artificial general intelligence. So I just want to, and then uh, just to go and take, I want to maybe do a couple more, two, two or three more sort of comments and we'll hopefully get back into the discussion. Just to say, I think one of the, the real confusions about AI and the term, and, and I forget who it was, it's I mean, Marina, I think was talking about the different types of AI. Absolutely, this is really one of the kind of the real problems um, in the sense that, uh, that we, we have to understand that there are there are many forms of AI. And I think this just this Russian model, the Russian dolls, uh, especially for Ellen of this, um, is that kind of gives you a sense of what we're talking about because what happens is in fact, this big, what you've got is a bigger a concept of AI um, which has been around since like 1951 or something like that, you know, and, and, and actually has changed completely. Within that, we have a category that is called machine learning. And within that, we have a category called uh, deep learning. And uh, so in a way, these are, it's important to understand this, this diagram in your head because we're largely going dealing with, with, with deep learning in this particular um, uh, uh, course. Uh, and that is part of AI. But at the same time, what's happening in AI um, is, well, at least when it was first used, the first kind of the first use of the term was so radically different to what um, uh, what's what's happening now. I think you know uh, yesterday in our discussion of shell structures, Chris Williams made the point that you know when he was first um, 
working on computation, he would go and get on his bicycle with a whole sort of kind of like pack of, of cards. He'd feed into the computer and this massive computer that he was using in the old days has less comp computational power than, than our, our simple cell phone. So the, what I would say is the world has changed um, completely from the early days of AI to something that we've got now. And yet we use the term AI and it's very confusing for a lot of people. I think it's important. That's why I think that we have to kind of be very precise about um, making a series of distinctions. To, this is what I found. I don't know, I didn't see anyone else did, but I found it really the best way to study it is to start, begin to try and make those distinctions and to understand to map those out so you've got some kind of concept. But deep learning is really, I think that to my mind, the, the, the thing that is really most exciting now, I think it's what Wan Yu is working on, especially within the category of machine learning. And just to say, the crucial difference is learning. In other words, um, the fact that, 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 that the machine can learn and one can even maybe use uh, AI in the broad sense of old fashioned AI, what is called good old fashioned AI, GoFe, um, to refer to something like Grasshopper. It's kind of, it's, but it's, it's kind of programming in some, but learning becomes something different. And I think this is the kind of crucial question that's, that's been, that's come in. That's actually, we're not talking about a tool that's static, but one is, that is able to learn, which is why it makes it, it makes AI such a threat because any other tool we've been challenged by, we've been able to deal with that, but AI, but deep machine learning is different. It can, it can learn from itself. Having said that, I think one of the things we've got to be very careful about the going back to this kind of question of translation, we use the term learning for both human learning and machine learning, um, and they're not the same. They're not the same. I think mean, we kind of like it's a kind of it's a language of convenience, but the way it learns, there are some similarities, but they're different. Um, and, and you know, I, I so I think that kind of like a, uh, um, we, we've got to be alert to those possibilities, and also to alert the possibility where people talk about AI. I've been in conversations where where people have kind of I think Marcus Novak and going to say, "Oh, we were doing it back in the '90s." Uh, no, you weren't. I mean, you can't do. You you could never have done in the '90s. What, what, what you can do now. And I want to maybe just skip on to a few things to, um, so there's the, the early things, um, I'm gonna, 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 gonna skip that as well. Um, uh, and, and, and talk about these, these categories or these kind of reasons, and, and maybe they're not ex exhaustive, but just to say, what, why, how, how are things developed in terms of, of, of where we are now? Why is it, it, it's such a difference? You know, and I think I would say, if you wanna make a simple comparison between what's happening now and what's happening in the very early days of AI, I would say, well, think about the difference between a very primitive car, like a you know, Model T Ford and a Tesla car. I mean, there's such a huge difference. We use the same term, but these were, this is what, from my research, I came across these five factors, and there may be more as to why um, we're now in a totally different domain um, than that. The, the fact that the algorithm has got way more sophisticated. Um, cloud services, you haven't got to use, you, you can use GPUs elsewhere and so on. You now have that possibility of harnessing way more computational power. Um, competition capital investment, there is, I mean, we'll also talk about this when we come to the question of history, the, the fact that there is huge competition in, into, in, in this now. And I mean, famously, Putin once said, whoever controls AI controls the world. There is a, I wouldn't say a cold war going on, but there's a, certainly there's a competition going on about how do we get there. Um, I, and then number four, significantly more co uh, college students, well, in the area of computation and, and, and so on. Of course, there are more, but what I would also add to that is to say there are more college students working in other areas such as architecture and who knows where else who are now engaging with AI, which is, I think, a, 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 an important point. And finally, the idea that there's significantly more um, data that's been generated, especially in China, that there's a huge amount of data. And I forget the statistics, something like in the last two years, the amount of data data has been um, has doubled. Um, so, um, uh, so, um, and I just want to say that, and I won't go to this either. But just just the, the distinctions of machine learning between different types of learning. We have these three different types: supervised learning, reinforcement learning, and unsupervised learning. Um, and uh, uh, with supervised learning, where you train something, and it's a bit in a way uh, actually it's kind of similar that uh, that uh, the way that we teach kids in some sense. You say, you know. This is a cat, this is a dog. So you label, you classify, label uh, material and do it in a very laborious kind of way. Um, that's one category of thing. And this is kind of interesting. One of my students, uh, Jörg Tubella, did a Google, when he was working on machine learning, um, reinforcement actually, he, he did a Google set of, of the word nail 
and actually he was looking at the nails, the, the, the architectural fixing, but then the Google found all these fingernails and, and it was kind of interesting how it's kind of came up with this like 90% sure that's a nail, of course it's never 100% sure. Um, and so on. So, uh, and then, uh, then there's unsupervised learning, which is, I think, the, what uh, Daniel was talking a lot about yesterday, um, as a way of kind of like it, it, it just discovers it cluster. You get clusters and things, um, uh, which actually, in a, some way, is also the way that we as human beings learn. In a sense, like um, you're immersed in a certain culture, whether it's an architectural office or a, um, a, um, a school of architecture. And there's a way that we, you pick things up just through kind of a immersion in that um, uh, in that sort of thing, in that, uh, that situation. And, and then finally, reinforcement learning is the way that um, uh, you get a reward. Um, uh, and this is actually becoming increasingly popular. Uh, it was used for AlphaGo, for example, um, uh, to, to training AlphaGo Zero was using re reinforcement learning. Um, and again, you know, that's also we have that in terms of the way that we learn as architects. We get rewards if we do a good project. We you know get a good grade if we in an architectural office if we we have a you know we we win the competition. So one could see that as going through. But one of the things I would say is that is that um, and this is one of the mind-boggling sort of things I think about a, about AI and deep learning in particular is um, the speed of operations. Now this is something that that I uh, will talk a bit more about AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero, which is probably the more the more interesting one, even though it didn't have so much a high profile, but the fact that that um, a machine can train itself to play Go without being given the, the given the sorry given the rules, it uh, you know it kind of it, it learns, and which is astonishing in itself, but also astonishing is the kind of the the speed at which it can learn. Now uh, this AlphaGo Zero played 4.9 million games against itself, which of course we couldn't do anyway in three days. That amounts to 20 games per second. I mean, that's mind blowing. Um, so in some ways, what I want to sort of point out, going back to that initial question about um, uh, um, from Margaret Bowden, I mean, are, is, are we trying to get machines to do what we do? Well, actually they, they far exceed at some level. Now, I'm not to say that it's so sophisticated. And in fact, you know, some of the stuff that's been used to, for example, this uh, uh, project by Autodesk where they're trying to pick up bits of Lego and, and build them. Um, uh, actually, human beings could do that much, much more quickly. We have more kind of um, skilled motility, more sense of, of how we handle the body. And it takes a while for a kid to learn to develop those, but not as long as it takes to, for a robot, for, for a robotic arm. But then again, the speed, when you do it in simulation, and that's the point about it, it's in simulation, the speed of operation is, is astonishing. Um, so, um, and I just, I'm not going to talk about this at all. Um, this is Pedro Domingos, um, actually, uh, uh, Costas put me on to him. Um, the different types of approaches, we'll talk more about this um, uh, connectionism being the kind of the, the one that is the most dominant right now in terms of neural networks, but uh, there's a history of this. There's also a history of Pedro Domingos, actually. I don't know if you know about this, Costas, but he was in the whole recent uh, um, ethics case. Um, he was seen to be the bad boy. He's not so popular in certain things. So anyway, I'm going to skip out of this now um, and um, come back to the conversation because I think there are some other kind of comments coming in. But I just wanted to go and cover those basic things. We can go. You can go further down the line in terms of these definitions or distinctions. Um, and I'm probably not the best person to comment on these things anyway. But I just want to say that one one has to be able to pick up on Marina's point. Be aware of the the the, um, the different forms of, of 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 intelligence. The different forms of learning. Um, um, yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, uh, there's uh, if anyone wants to go and go back to any other sort of que any questions. Now we've got about uh, uh, twelve minutes left. Um, do we have burning questions? I can see that. Yeah. Let me just read one out from the, from the um, from the chat. This is Eleanor, whose whose microphone's not working. Um, uh, um, in addition to my first my, to my question before, we were saying that the person, leader, country who will understand the brain and its processes will control the word, world. That's Putin. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but recently we heard another phrase, the leader of art in artificial intelligence will rule the world. Okay, that's not the same thing. Um, yeah, the rule of, that's again, it's Putin. The rule, the rule of artificial intelligence will rule the world. Um, um, oh, there's another question above. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, do you want to read it out, Marina? Yeah, I can read it. Is okay. artificial intelligence the next phase of human evolution? Before, we always consider evolution as a biological process based on Darwin's concept of survival or fitness. fitness. 
As a species, we reach the point where our biological capabilities can keep out with technology's capability. With AI evolving as a fourth industrial revolution, we are talking that technological evolution took control over biological evolution. Or the next phase of evolution is a mixture of biological and technological evolutions. I'm reminded there of a comment that um, uh, Mamul Delanda was making about genetic algorithms, about evolving systems. And he said, well, actually, that's what we do anyway in design. You know, you kind of do five designs and you pick one out, find the best one. And um, I just say genetic algorithms is a kind of biological model that initially was introduced by John Holland, um, one of the, the first person to do a computer science PhD ever um, uh, at the University of Michigan. He was, we actually interviewed him for our Swarm Intelligence book that was Roland Snooks and I interviewed John Holland, fantastic guy, but he, he introduced the kind of biological metaphor. And strangely, at a kind of parallel world, uh, John Fraser in, at the AA in London, uh, well, he's at Cambridge or the AA at the time, was also looking at kind of the possibility of evolutionary um, algorithms to, to look at things and model things. Um, but to Landa's point is, 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 is that that is what we're doing anyway. So we've got 10 more minutes for, for some discussion and some comments. Um, um we can go back uh, yeah maybe i can add something on, on intelligence uh, uh, when you look at uh, kids because uh, many of you mentioned the way kids i mean not the way kids learn but the fact that that uh, learning is probably the key word in uh, intelligence and obviously also in our artificial intelligence because the world the, the very idea of artificial artificial intelligence compared to many other kind of, uh, let's say, machinic intelligence is based on the fact that there is a learning process. Uh, regarding this, I also believe that we, we don't know that much about the way human beings learn. We know, for example, that uh, we have to go to school to learn things, etc., etc. But uh, if I take the example of my two nieces, for example, uh, one is eight years old and uh, the other one is four. Uh, the, they both speak perfect, I mean, not perfect, but I would say almost perfect English. And they never went to, to school. They never had any English class. And they learned that just by using the, their applications on smartphones. So in fact, uh, they almost let's say they almost know how to read English while uh, the, I mean, the, smaller, the smallest one, uh, the, the youngest one, doesn't know how to read Greek, but she almost know how to read English phrases and she knows how to speak English. So uh, I think we know also very little about the most efficient way uh, human beings can, can learn. And I believe that ultimately the relationship between the learning process and the creation of, of new uh, uh, connections in the brain is definitely the key element. And the problem is that, for example, at schools, we keep going to schools until uh, yeah, almost 30 years old uh, for some people studying medicine and things like that. But at that moment, we create very, very few new connections in the brain, which, uh, uh, and this is also why, why it's not that efficient to study at that moment. So it's based on that, I, I believe that the relationship between, between machine learning and the, the, the way the brain is learning things is very interesting. As you said, Neil, at the very beginning, you took the example of, uh, of Greg Reynolds uh, with swarm algorithms, with, with bots, and you said that what you are interested in, in is probably ultimately that we can use machine learning to understand better how the brain is working and what human intelligence is, is about. I, I, I fully agree with that, and I, I would say that uh, I'm more, I, I am more or less sure that it will happen because we have very little way to experiment with, uh, with, with the learning process with human beings. For example, there's no way that we can deprive 
uh, kits of such or such a stimulus just for the sake of experimenting. It's not ethical, obviously, but this is something we can, we can do very easily with a computer. So with machine learning, it's very easy to, let's say, to remove half of a certain kind of images, half of a certain kind of data, and to see how the resulting algorithm perform, if, it's, if, it, if it will perform well or not, for example. So I, 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 I'm absolutely convinced that the next revolution in neuroscience will be based on, on the capacity of experimenting with machine learning. I'm, I'm convinced by that. Um, and I have one comment. I, I don't know if uh, maybe when you, you, you want yeah. to, to pick I up. I just okay. want to add a little bit um, uh, on uh, Philip's uh, uh, yeah, point. Because uh, I, I sometimes use uh, this metaphor to compare uh, humans being and uh, AI. Is uh, there's uh, three things makes uh, humans different to each other. First thing is our IQ. Second thing is the methodology. Third thing is our experience. Uh, but the IQ, I think mostly people are same or very similar. And the methodology, when we get education, it's very similar. And third thing is the uh, uh, experience. Experience came from the environment we uh, we get uh, uh, in touch with and uh, the, the thoughts we get out from it. So this is a thing. If we compare this to computer, our IQ is just equals to the computational power. It's everywhere similar. And the second is the methodology is just uh, equal to uh, algorithms. I think most algorithms are open source today. And the only difference makes all the AI different is the data and how you set up those data. I think this is uh, something um, we, we, yeah, we think uh, uh, AI and this uh, human being um, in some similarities, yeah. I, I would like to, to uh, make a controversial point here, <laughs> just to stimulate the conversation. Yeah, but uh, uh, it, one, one, week, um, one week ago, we have a Digital Futures Amazonian Rainforest uh, uh, event it was in amazing. Uh, one of the speakers was uh, Ana Maria. She uh, spoke about education as a way of colonization. I mean, I mean, I'm from Argentina, I'm from South America, and we have like a <laughs> kind of a strange uh, relationship with uh, Colón and all these kind of things, and our culture and our roots and so on. So, uh, and one comment that Niels uh, made was, uh, who, who, who are the, the savage here? And uh, I, I, I want to introduce this because I, I want to think, don't you think that in a way, artificial intelligence is a way of colonization as well? I mean, it's not only education, a way of colonization. Don't you think that artificial intelligence could be a way of colonization? For, for whom is a question? <laughs> for anyone. No, yeah, in, general, question I, in general. <laughs> Because no, I, I was thinking about these two sides. I don't know if it's so binary, it's like two sides, like the good and the bad side no? of artificial intelligence. But in a way, uh, there is like an ethical uh, thing behind all this. And there is also a political message about uh, uh, behind all what we are talking. And maybe we are not trying to do this, but in a way, we are anyway under this uh, kind of um, uh, effect of uh, artificial intelligence as a as a as a way of colonization, because uh, we, we, yeah, <laughs> because uh, we, we we are uh, making this parallelism between education and artificial intelligence. We are not talking about learning. Learning is another thing. Learning is, uh, from my point of view, it's absolutely different. I mean, it can be involved in artificial intelligence, but this we are I'm not discussing learning as a way of colonization. I'm discussing education as a way of colonization, because we are talking about biases and all, all these certain things that are uh, sort of things that they are behind. Uh, maybe it's too controversial to talk about right now at the end of our conversation. Maybe we can lay it open to think, but yeah, I was thinking about it. Too. 
I, I thought it was directed at me. I don't know, but because we have this history with Argentina, the Malvinas, and the Falklands, and whatever, and we are the ultimate colonizers, the Brits, right? We go and stick our flag everywhere. And you know, I, I actually was brought up in Hong Kong, um, which is very close to where, where Wan Yu is working now, at Hong Kong U, and also close to Shenzhen. And um, um, when it was British, right? And, and I'm very pleased it's not British. You know, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 the British were so patronizing about Hong Kong. It was it's fantastic. That it's not. Uh, but at the same time, what I would say is sometimes, you know, that there's a there's a danger of seeing this in a very kind of one way system. Now, I'm not talking about colonization per se, but I know that there is, for example, people have this kind of gripe about about Google, uh, um, you know, and, and I've well, for example, um, there's a whole, the book recently came out and I'm just, the, Joanna Selinska, she's going on about Google, how unethical it is. Well, I don't know. I mean, I know the Google, uh, uh, there's a, the, the Frank Gehry building with the binoculars mm. is right next door here on Venice Beach, where I am right now. Um, but I would just say, you know, in a way, you know, sure. But then, and and and, and then the same goes with the kind of people who are anti kind of um, uh, anti kind of capitalism or anti anti making money. You know the artists, especially. Well, the, you, they're very happy to be paid for their for their artwork and, and so on. And you know who doesn't want to use Go, Google? And I think there's some way that we are kind of willingly part of that. You know, there's a kind of critique of uh, the Guy de Bois kind of critique of the spectacle. Well, to what extent do we buying into that anyway? We're quite happy to buy into that. But um, so that's a provocative uh, response to a provocative question. <laughs> Yeah, just the, like a uh, car again, the car thing I, I used to uh, make metaphor. Today, we, we will not compete with car for running and we drive the cars. Yeah, that's my point. I would say that um, everything is, is a process of colonization. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, I don't believe we can separate so strictly uh, the process of learning and what you call Marina, uh, what you're referring to as colonization. Maybe, maybe on scientific terms, right? Maybe we could consider learning on a purely scientific basis as biological, as, as a biological process, the way the way the brain creates new connections, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Then maybe there's a, a possibility here to create a, a, a strict difference, distinction between learning and, and education. But uh, in the real life, I believe it doesn't happen that way. In the real life, uh, there's always this kind of merge and, and you know, for, just imagine that a kid learns by himself uh, how to use a spoon, you know? And then uh, maybe maybe the mother or father or whatever will say, oh, maybe you, you need to do it that way. You know, you need to you need to hold the spoon in that way. It's part education, it's partly education, it's partly learning. You could say mm -hmm. that uh, there is some cultural things here. Obvious, obviously there are. You you can see that in good families uh, they eat extremely well, they hold the spoon in a very specific manner, for example. So you have all these spiritual habits, all these things. But making a very clear distinction between what is part of the natural learning of how to use a spoon and what is part of the, uh, of the education. Uh, yeah, I would say, yes, it's possible to make a distinction, but ultimately uh, in the real life, it's always, it goes always together. And we, we, if we were looking for strict distinction about that for everything, we wouldn't be able to learn anymore. You see, we would, wouldn't be able to learn because then we would need, need to ask ourselves, every time we do something, is it the right way to do it? And then this right way is partly defined by, uh, let's say, um, yeah, cultural cultural practices. It's defined by ergonomics. It's defined by many things, and we don't do it. And uh, sometimes we have to also maybe to accept uh, some sort of uh, colonization, because accepting colonization is in fact also accepting some common rules, you know. And these common rules are, are also what makes uh, a life altogether. Uh, doable. 
probably it wouldn't probably we would we wouldn't be able to live all together without some sort of common common behavior. So just imagine that you go at a at a lunch and there are 10 people and you have those 10 people eating uh, the way they want without ever being taught how, how we should properly uh, eat. It's almost impossible, you know. Uh, I, I think it would it would I think it would be a very dysfunctional lunch, ultimately. So accepting some some sort of colonization is also is also accepting to be part of a more global uh, setup uh, so that we can communicate and, and live all together. I think that's a fantastic point at which to, 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 to leave things a, a global was it platform on which we can communicate and learn things together. I think this is what we've been doing actually in an interesting way. I mean, I don't know, I was I wasn't sure this was going to work out today. Well, I thought it would do, and it has worked out. It's been an incredibly interesting conversation. And I think we we have a kind of an interesting, as I say, a kind of brain in operation, a collective brain, which is I think is is fascinating. And I hopefully we're kind of charting out some possibilities for educational models in the future. But I just want to thank everybody for being part of this. I mean, I, I, I always say I learn from my, from my most here, and uh, anyway, I've learned a lot myself. And I think that uh, this promises a lot for the future, especially the discussion about creativity, I think. But uh, um, anyway, next week we will be uh, exactly the same time. Um, We'll also be live streaming again uh, um, on Really Billion YouTube, and we were looking at the question about consciousness. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I hopefully it'll be it'll it'll be an emergent way we'll address a lot of other things. But at the same time, I want to try and make sure that we 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 leave space to do the things that we like. Creativity, maybe we could try and say for, for the creativity session, but this has been a, a very rewarding experience for me. So I just want to thank everybody um, here today. We're going to be putting this up on the uh, the YouTube, um, and uh, so you can go back and check on this. But um, uh, thank you. Any any final comments for anyone? Oh, uh, just the one no, more nice. I want to add. Yeah. Okay. Is uh, in a way cars uh, colonize the all our infrastructure, whether we drive the cars. <laughs> yeah. Will we drive cars anymore? That's the other question. I mean, I think uh, one of the conclusions I came to, just a, this is a kind of a thought to finish on, and I forget the name of the, the book, or the author, the author, the book was called The Machines That Think, uh, Walsh, someone Walsh, and he's kind of said, well, actually, you know, what's going to happen with driving cars is that um, we are... Uh, we're going to lose our driving skills because increasingly we, we will, you know, car, the cars will drive themselves. We'll lose our driving skills and the insurance premiums will go up for human beings. And, you know, what happens is, is that after a while we won't bother driving. And the, but the most important comedy makes is a beautiful comedy and we won't even know or care. I mean, what's interesting because we use the word revolution. Yeah. Actually, the comment made about self-driving cars is incremental. It's an evolutionary thing. It's just simply the way it happens, as I, I, I find out from uh, my student, Darren, is that basically you get you get software updates from, from, from Tesla. And it, it yeah. and then suddenly, and it was somewhere in last semester, uh, you know, Darren, that's, I, my car is self-driving, you know, and uh, that's the question. It, and, and as we... And of course, let me finish on a very provocative note, as we probably will get phased out as architects, um, will we even realize, will we even know or care? That's a, a super provocative comment, but hopefully we'll have lots of provocative discussions to, uh, to follow. So I just want to thank everyone for today. It's been very illuminating for everyone, I hopefully, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're sharing this to other people around the globe. Um, um, so thank you, everyone. I will simply say- Thanks a lot. Just thank one, you. one- Thank you. Thank well, you for having us. Final comment, the session next week. We also have a session on Friday um, for the Miami Urban Studies on Zaha in, in, in Miami. Uh, Patrick Schumacher will be zooming in. Um, and uh, and then on, on for Digital Futures, which is of course not part of this, but uh, um, we have a session on interactive design with uh, Ben Asfarahi is, is, is hosting it and, and uh, Philip uh, Beasley and um, uh, Guvenj Ozil and Rory Glynn are gonna be part of that. So that should be exciting too. So. Thank you, and uh, see you all um, on th Friday and on Saturday next uh, uh, next week. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. bye.